So, how did we get here? Hello, Melina. Thank you very much for being Hi. here. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and hello to everybody watching. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. 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 It's good. nice to see you. So this good. is, for those of you watching, uh, this is the second time we're trying to do this. The last time uh, Skype messed with us, or I guess the internet did. I, I'm not going to blame Skype. There's enough blame going around <laughs> on, on Skype. <laughs> To begin with. Skype didn't do anything, okay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's the it's problem. Just, it's just <laughs> our terribly, terribly traffic, you know, there's too much traffic on the interwebs. Yeah, days. exactly. That's all. So we'll see how this works out today. But uh, I'm excited yes. and uh, I feel like I'm much better prepared today than I was on Friday too, because on Friday I got all this new equipment, like I'm using this, this awesome new webcam and I'm using this uh, clip-on microphone, which allows me to cool. wear my trademark hat. So, yeah, ah, you know, very no? important. And uh, so, exactly. <laughs> and I see you're, yeah, you're, you're as well prepared as you were last week. I, um, I am. I am. Yeah. I am. Cool. I'm good. I got my, I got my coffee. I got, I got my water. I got my skull and uh, got the a skull, spider exactly. for Halloween. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a really nice. So I'm already. I have a really nice photo of you with that skull from, I don't know, 2015, 16. Oh. Like you were performing yeah, on Halloween hair, and the hair. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And I think it was, yes. it was even taken in the house of jazz. So we should have right. a minute of silence. Yeah. For the house I remember of I had jazz. a show there. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Well, the Laval one is still, it's still there. Uh, pending. It's the Montreal one that closed down. Right. Uh, but the Laval, which is a, for those who don't know, is kind of like a suburb of Montreal. Exactly. Or like yeah, you can say that. Um, there is a second House of Jazz, uh, which opened, you know, way after the first one. But uh, it's still theoretically open, except right now we're in lockdown. Lovely 2020 uh, mm -hmm. effect. Uh, but we're, so they're not open at the moment. Yeah. But hopefully... They will open. open again. And hopefully they'll yeah. stay above water. I wonder if there's any chance oh, of the gosh. original one coming back in some shape. Oh, no. Not, no. Well, well, you know, maybe. Un I mean, unlikely. maybe when this whole pandemic thing is behind us, if it will ever be behind yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we may, we may <laughs> start, touch on, on, on this pandemic. Start not there, Melina. Great. At some point in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm feeling better because I have more endorphins in my system due to my new exercise machines that I just bought over right, the weekend. Yeah. So I'm feeling like happy about this lockdown in a sense because now I get to use, I have an excuse to use my equipment. Yeah. So it's not bad. I just half expected you to say like you have more endorphins because of the cocaine you snorted. <laughs> now everything's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that too. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So before before we go into into the thick of it, um, I'm going to give the, the little intro blurb I like to give at the beginning of these podcasts because I'm sure there's going to be listeners and viewers who are new to this. And um, so I, I'm just going to say what this is about, what's going to happen, and also just to set the stage for you as well as my guest. Um, this podcast is intended as a portrait. So it's supposed to be sort of a mini memoir in a way just to bring out your personality traits and to inspire new perspectives for our listeners. And in order to do that, what I'm going to do is with you, I'm going to go on a journey through your life. We're going to look at times, places and philosophy. And we're also going to do this as a dialogue. Uh, it's not just to, going to be like I ask questions, you answer, but I want you to be as inquisitive with me as I am with you. So don't hesitate to ask uh, questions of your own or throw my questions back to me and we'll see where, where this is going to lead. Mm -hmm. It shall be interesting. Sure. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Hey, that was, a, that, was, that was a great intro blurb. Thank you. <laughs> you were more prepared than Friday. <laughs> it's almost like I learned it by heart yeah. and I didn't have it on my other screen to read off of. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Thank I'm you. ready. Super You're ready. You're ready? Cool. Um, I want to start by talking about what, in, in my mind, really defines you as, uh, like, for all the time that I've known you and also as my friend, um, you're a musician. Um, and I, that's totally what I want to get into with you first. And I'm sure this is this subject, uh, just the music you make and our, our lives with music is probably going to dominate most of this discussion, to be fair, um, mm. unless unless we happen to swing over to Corona and you spend the next three hours around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> music, music and COVID, that's what uh, we're yeah. going to talk about. <laughs> I actually went to the length yeah. of, uh, like I actually even brought you three albums here. Like I have this, this is City of Love from Oh, hey, you have all three? Hmm? 
You have all three? I, I do have all three. Like you actually, oh, wow. I think this is one of the last few remaining copies of uh, yep. City of Love. Yeah, that one's no, like no longer being me... uh, created, manufactured. So exactly. those are relics now. Yeah. <laughs> so I've yep, got, the, the, I've got a rarity. The, uh, the video. Next mm -hmm. time we meet, you should sign it for me. Uh, <laughs> so this is from yeah. 2009. And... Uh, I actually yeah. went ahead and listened to all three of them today, just to also just talk about a little bit wow. more about the, the details. You know that there are some unreleased songs also on my website. I don't know if you know that, but on the music page at the bottom, I did totally at the bottom, there's a bunch of other ah. So there's an extra little mini discography for you to oh, discover. No, wait, but, uh, but there is some extra songs at the bottom of the music page on my website. You know what? Um, now that you say that, uh, I remember we even yeah. had that when we built the iteration of your website that we did together, right? I think we had those. Yeah, yeah they had a bunch well, of it, is, it is still your iteration. It's still your website. Like oh, it's really? the same design as what you made for me. So for those of you who don't know, oh my God. Uh, Matt, Matt, Matt <laughs> I thought is, at some point, yeah, still is a website designer, right? Yes. Um, and uh, and he's he's done at least two of my own websites. Uh, that's kind of how we've worked together and gotten to know each other for so long. Yeah. Um, including my artist website and also my booking agency website, which. Sadly, no longer in operation right now, not due yeah. to coronavirus, just due to the arts being a difficult thing to sell in the first place. We'll talk about that, too. But, um, yes, the, the booking agency, but that was still a very nice time of my life when I was trying to get this off the ground. It was. But anyway, it was a good time. We designed those, you designed those websites uh, with me, and yeah. yeah and uh, that's what we're talking about right here. Nice. So anyway, there's extra music um, at some point you recordings that have never over. been yeah. officially released onto an album of any kind, or, that, or sometimes collaborations with other artists as well. Yeah. So those are appearing in the unreleased section at the bottom of the page. I remember the collaboration. Man, I need to listen to those again. Yeah. Sure some of those are, the, some of those are really well. fun. Like, yeah. really, really fun. Yeah, I can imagine. And there's, I, I there was one really raunchy that are, like, one, wasn't there? Recordings. I'm sorry? There was one that was really raunchy. There was one that was oh, very there, sexual, there's, there's I remember. <laughs> there's a couple. <laughs> all of them. All the outtakes. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. I like to explore different aspects of, of life. Yeah. And sometimes I put myself in a character, you know? Yeah. And this is this is interesting because, like, um, you know, sometimes people are like, well, what's this song about? Yeah. And, like, I can give you my interpretation of what the song's about, but the thing is, it may not even be my own life. It might just be like, and I'm inspired by an idea, you know, or right. if I was in a position of somebody else, I put myself in that position and I'm going to write from that perspective. So sometimes I write songs like that. Yeah. And, so I'm uh, not going to say which ones are mine and which ones are perspectives, but I'll let people decide for themselves. <laughs> you know what, when I, when I listen to your three albums today, that's something that I thought about. Um, like some of the songs, like for instance, Bang Bang, is uh mm -hmm. is is not about it's not autobiographical or anything it's just like it's stories you know it, it's a story it's the scene that you set yeah um and, and you tell a yeah. certain story you know and that's what a lot of artists do of course like a lot of music that we listen to is, is probably not autobiographical right um but it's just uh people right. or artists writing stories about characters and um, that's one thing I noticed yeah. that um, came to my mind. But I also remember we, uh, I went to one of your gigs. Uh, it was up on Saint Laurent, like between Saint, between Montreal and like there's that place on the left. If you go, oh. if you go north from Montreal, was it the one where I was playing with the three other girls? I th yeah, yeah, was I think show? so. Oh no, but yeah, yeah it was that venue. The... It was that venue, Melina. But I think you were playing a lot. It was just you oh. on that evening. It could have been. It could oh. have been. I know you did one with Mari Zilt and uh, and one other girl. Anyway, yeah. but you were, you were talking yeah, but it about wasn't, that was a different show. Yeah. Okay. Could be. <laughs> I don't remember. Anyway, and I for remember... those of you who don't know, uh, so I'm I'm a pianist. Yeah. As you, as you can see, this exactly. is my office right here. Uh, I'm a pianist, piano teacher, and um, and singer songwriter. So, and my style has varied quite a bit over the years. But overall, I like to say it that has. I'm. Pop, jazz, or mm -hmm. jazz and pop, kind of like a mixture. What would you say? Do you think it's something like that? That that then totally some, like, to, to my too. mind. <laughs> yeah, but some it's dancing it's, stuff. it's always it it is true. But um, I would say on a generally it's pop, and clearly there's there's jazz mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. Um, okay. That, I mean, so, when when I so tell pop, people what you do, thing. that's what I say. I say she, I say she does pop jazz. So, yeah. Okay. It is that. There you go. Perfect. Um, yeah. I remember. So, so yeah. I don't remember what show you, which one you're talking about, but I remember uh, 
if you're talking about the one where I'm with three other girls on stage, um, that was, I think it was called La Vitola, the name of the it could venue. Be, yeah, it could be. I it's don't know if you were there floor. for that one. It's but on that the was first... the last time I did an, a show entirely of my own original material. Oh, yeah? The last time. Yeah, really? and that was about... So since then, where you've been doing covers? Years ago. I only do... Well, I'll throw in my originals here and there. Yeah. But yeah, for, since then, all the shows I do are covers or jazz standards. And, I didn't uh, even realize you that. Know, that's what Funny. I get hired to do. I guess, yeah. I mean, you need to do what pays, artist, I guess. Right? Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. I mean, but I, I get don't it. mind it. I mean, I like playing... Of course. ...tunes that I like, you know? Yeah. Um, I only play tunes that I like. Let's, let's be very clear. <laughs> so I like a lot of covers. I like a lot of pop stuff, a lot of you know uh, uh rock stuff disco dance i like all that mm, stuff mm. i do it in my own way so yeah, and if adapted. people enjoy it people enjoy it i just i just love being on stage so yeah you know whatever spreads joy yeah, yeah. it's true but it's i mean and, and i and, and I hopefully admire, one day my own I, music will spread as much joy <laughs> sorry and think, one day hopefully my own music will spread as much joy that would know? be wonderful yeah my own original music. I, to, to my mind it, yeah. it spreads as much joy but i get that um, people want to listen to the things that they are that they like already, that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with, yeah. right? And you can only push them so yeah. far out of their comfort zone because before they're like, I don't know, man. I you know, like any Bill, like you can't do Billy Joel. Like <laughs> Billy Joel does a concert, he has to pay, play piano, man. At this point, like what you know, people are going to be like, well, he didn't play it. No matter what. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, like exactly. if I if I went, I would like to hear like a deep album cut. Like I would like to hear When in Rome from the Stormfront album. That's such a beautiful song, you know. But nobody mm. gives a crap about mm. that song because it wasn't a single. It wasn't, you know, like it's, it's just track seven or something right. on that album, you know. Um, and I, I, I find that I find that as an as an audience member, I'm I'm more difficult to please that way because I I enjoy a live gig most when people take music that um, when people play music that's not you know, been played to death that not everybody knows. And then especially if it or if it's something I know and, and already like, but they go nuts with it. Right. Like that band OAR. Right. But I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that your reaction to a live show or your interpretation of, of music mm. is at a deeper. You have a deeper level of, of, of uh, understanding and like it's appreciation true. for it, I think, than the yeah. average person. I think that the average person, especially if they're not a musician themselves and they don't necessarily know that many musicians, um, you know, music to them is just kind of like something in the background. It's yeah. just yeah. kind of something that like is either either you know if it's if it's loud, it's really just to get them up and dancing, and if it's otherwise, keep it soft in the background. <laughs> you know, um, unless you are surrounded by musicians and artists, it's your appreciation of it is not going to be as as deep let's yeah say. not necessarily we'll just, we'll just put it that true. way and so yeah and not everyone is super open to different styles of music you know not everyone that too and also keep in mind when i'm playing a show let's say with covers and stuff like that i mean I, i'm only playing hit singles from other artists so every single song i pick for the most part is going to be was a hit single it's at, in its time you know what i mean so yeah. I'm, you know heavy hitters whereas if i do my you know no one artist did created only heavy hitters, right? Of course. Every artist has had some successful songs and some B-sides, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, for so, sure. Um, so it's normal that when you're going to do a, a, a show with like 30 covers and, every, and all 30 of those are hit single songs from major artists, if you do them well, you're going to get a pretty good reaction. Your chances are you're going to get a pretty good reaction from, a, from the crowd, you True. know, because you're going to hit, you're going to touch on someone's favorite artist at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the way true. I look at it. Um, yeah. I remember you saying in that in that particular gig, you were, you were um, doing a lot of, you were introducing the songs and you were talking about what they mean to you and why you wrote them. And um, there was, I think it's from yeah. this album, from Hold On, uh, from 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my, that's my second album. <laughs> exactly, it's your second album. And I thought, hang on. Was it on that? No, it might have been on the first album. You're talking about... Um, how it was about saving the environment and like how how we treat oh, the planet. Oh, new phase. New phase. I there it is. Phase. Yes, that's new phase, and, and it's actually, on the that first. one's on both albums. <laughs> oh, you have it on both. Yeah, it's true. You did. Yeah, albums. you recorded. You recorded so, new uh, two versions of it. Yeah, yeah, two different versions of it, um, which is which is kind of funny. But 
uh, hey, apparently it's not. I'm not the first artist to ever do that. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that song was about uh, yeah, kind of about taking a look at at the planet and what we're doing to like physically to our environment mm -hmm. and how we need to take more responsibility for it. And uh, you know, it's kind of a call to action. Yes. That tune. Yeah. And I think even the live version of that song was another, yet another type of, another version. <laughs> it wasn't like either of the, uh, yeah. the first two. Either. Yeah, exactly. Also because you have limited <laughs> yeah. instrumentation, right? Like the, the songs and the albums are uh, yeah. very well produced. There's a lot of, there's guest musicians, more, more there's produced. sound production on them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, right. Another thing that I kept thinking or that, that I, I think is something that I, I see in the state of music today. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Um, when you listen to songs mm -hmm. on the radio uh, today, as opposed to, let's say, stuff that came out in the 80s and 90s, you're less likely to hear an instrumental solo in there. Like, I, I don't feel oh, yes. that musicians really let their instruments speak as much anymore. Like in the 80s, it was commonplace mm -hmm. uh, to, have a, to have a guitar mm -hmm. solo, to have a sax solo. To have like, I yep. mean, Mike and the Mechanics did a whistling solo. That was in '95. In uh, I don't know if you know that song, "Over My Shoulder," and like the the bridge, the instrumental uh, part is just the guy whistling. I, yeah, you know, and that, that, yeah. like, I feel yeah, like that that's, adds that's a, so much a... to a song, you know, and that gets lost. There's there's a lot of that that's that, that that's lost, and I, I find that that's quite sad because. Mm -hmm. It's because of the changing times. People, yeah. and actually I had this conversation with my producer I'm working with now. Yeah. So I'm working with um, this fabulous Montreal producer called Albert Chambers. He is called Albert Chambers. <laughs> the studio is called <laughs> Basement Studios. That's what they studios. call him. Um, anyway, <laughs> and he's, um, he was telling, because so I'm in the process of recording a fourth album right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, original material again. And now I'm going in a, in a different direction, which I'm considering a little bit more authentic. Um, but... I'm of the opinion, like you, I'm like, maybe we should have a nice wailing guitar solo right here. Yeah. And then he'll be like, well, it's going to, you know, it's going to go over the three minutes and a half mark. Oh, Jesus fucking Songs Christ. Songs today got to be three minutes and a half. But you know what, Billy Joel like... was complaining about that in 1970 something. I don't know if you oh, know his not, song, The Entertainer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nothing's changed. He's like, it was nothing's a beautiful changed, song. Well, hang on, let me see if I yeah. get the lyrics. He's like... Uh, uh, it took me years to write it. They were the best years of my life. Uh, it was a beautiful song, but they, it ran too long, so they cut it down to three or five. If you're gonna have yeah, a hit, you gotta exactly. make it fit. something like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's always it's, been that it's way. It's crazy, like, oh. but there is there is that formula. <sighs> yep. But there is that, that musical I mean, formula, and the thing is, okay, not every song is need yeah. to follow those rules. No. However, if you want the best chance for success, commercial success, then yes, yeah. it, it technically does. You, you need to does, follow those right? rules, yeah. and that's just. That's that's just what's uh, what's popular today, and it's not and it's this it's not just now. It's since the probably turn of the two thousands. Can yeah. we say that the turn of the century? Yeah, is that? Yeah, no, that, <laughs> probably, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I do feel yeah, yeah it's 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 become less and less. You know, it's diminished. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the problem has been there before. If you go I, into guess... the jazz world, they still have lots of solos. Yeah, they do. Jazz jazz records will still have tons of solos. Or even reggae jazz. and stuff like they, that. They're, you... they're kind of timeless. <laughs> yeah, that's timeless. true. Yeah, and it, it, I, I think with jazz, yeah. it's more about the instruments anyway, right? Like there's more, there's more yeah. of that. There's more technical finesse in the way they're playing, and there's like people are more admired yes. for um, how they play their instruments and how well they do it. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of jazz, uh, do you have my jazz album? Yeah, I know let's, 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 let's shout but... that to the, to the camera as well. So that's the one from 2018. Ah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's my latest one. Two years exactly. ago. <laughs> yeah. You know what? The Velvet um, Lounge. The camera actually flip, flips things around, right? That's funny. Anyway, just imagine... Uh, the well, other... <laughs> to me, watching you, it's actually not flipped. No? To okay. me, well, watching then, you, then you're not good. flipped. Okay, on my screen, yeah, it's so flipped. So anybody watching this will will see the flipped version. But yeah, this is uh, the one we did in 2018. And I'm saying we because all the photos that's and right. all the designs are yep, mine. So right. I did this album and it's something mm -hmm. I'm very proud of. It's yep. the only time I got yeah, to do Matt, this. Matt, Matt was the, the guest uh, saxophone player on the uh, album. <laughs> that's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wish I wish I could play. I was really good at an instrument. I can hit some keys on a keyboard, on a, on a, on a piano. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you said you used to play a little bit of music. No, like you play guitar or something. No, um, I do play piano a little bit. 
as in I don't right. I don't I'm not going to say I play because I don't but uh, I I know how to play the piano um yeah. a little but that's literally okay. like I mean I'm not really good at it the thing is I I learned um I, did, I took piano lessons when I was a kid um mm -hmm. I, I once asked my mom do you remember when I did, took piano lessons and she was like We paid for eight years for you doing that. <laughs> like, thank you, ah, mom. So eight years, hey, that's pretty good. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was surprised eight, when stayed, she said if that. If you stuck with it for eight years, you probably got pretty far. No, actually, I didn't. You know, as no, a kid, I'm sure you're like, I'm sure you, you got go further home, than, you, you, than you realize. I guess, I guess. And, and I mean, what I did during the time I was in Montreal, which was from 2008 to 2018, I took another few years of piano lessons, actually. And I oh. had an e-piano in my home. Uh, right. You might have actually, you might so, yeah. remember that I did. Um I actually don't. I didn't even okay. know that you did that. Yeah. I don't think you ever told me. <laughs> I yeah. think I'm keeping it a secret. <laughs> But I, yeah, I, I might not have mentioned it. That's just the thing because it's like, you know, you try. I never different... saw a piano in your place. No, it was in the old place. I don't think so. In the in the old place on Saint uh, Saint Urban, like the one I lived with. Oh. Uh, with the roommates. Actually, maybe I never was in your old place. You might have not even been there. Yeah, that's true. That's quite possible. I think I only... Or perhaps uh, you, for a birthday on, party or something, uh, and then you only saw the living room. So. Could be. But yeah, you were over more often when I was in the new place. Or the second yeah. place. Yeah, <laughs> I forget what street that was, but uh, yes, that uh, street. Breber. I remember that. I remember your apartment very well. Yeah, exactly. But I don't uh, remember the street. That was, was a good anyway, apartment. Yeah. You know what's funny? This, this January, I went back to Montreal, and I went to the old apartment. I went to the street, you know, where the apartment is. And I looked through the window mm -hmm. and I noticed that the the curtains that I put up when I moved in, they're still there. So I'm like, yes, yeah. some some part of me lives on in that apartment. <laughs> But so yeah, the person who was that, inside saw you probably staring in at their window. Just sitting, <laughs> yeah, creepy. standing there all creepy, yeah, like in a black hat, black coat, you know, like in the rain. <laughs> That's exactly what it was like. No, um, way, way to scare people off. <laughs> yeah, and why not, you know. Uh, I'm like you, you fucker. You're living in my place. <laughs> this just, I'm, I'm watching time. you. Pre, pre <laughs> exactly. That was in January. So yeah. that was just the pandemic was yeah. just building. Yeah, not really hitting yet. Anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that happened. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I took um, piano lessons for another few years, and then I. But you know, it always died down again, and I found myself like, mm. you know, how you do a certain thing in your life, and you just you, you want to get back to doing more of it, like it's for me it that is photography for instance yeah. or web design or teaching myself new mm. tricks in web design like now i actually bought this mm -hmm. 1200 page book about seo uh just to finally get that thing licked you know and um so i'm, I'm going to start reading that and educating myself in that way and it's like if i if i feel that inner drive to do that then i then obviously that's the kind mm -hmm. of thing i should be mm -hmm. doing you know so that's how i got to be the photographer I am today. And I like to think I'm pretty good. People tell me I'm pretty good. So I guess I am. <laughs> I, I tell you you're pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> and, I attest to that. <laughs> yeah. And that's just because, you know, like you do, you, you practice, you do, you take a few thousand photos and then a few thousand more and then eventually yeah. you get really good at it. But that, with, the, with the piano, I never, it was always like, oh yeah, I should do piano. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll play some more piano tomorrow. Right. And, um, I'm That's thinking okay. if I were to ever go back and try piano again, because I haven't yet given up entirely on the idea. There might be a point in my life where I try again. <laughs> um, but then what I wouldn't yeah. do is I wouldn't probably wouldn't take classes, um, but I would just mm -hmm. sit in front of the piano and just press keys and just play, uh, just improvise with the thing yeah. until eventually yeah. uh, something recognizable comes out. Because I found that the, me teaching myself anything, I just I just learn by trial and error. That's how I learn. Like if somebody gives me, okay. it's also the way I cook, you know. Um, like if somebody gives me a recipe, if somebody gives me an, uh, Jesus, what's the word? A man instruction manual, right? And like, okay. get that out of my You're face. Like, Never mind. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just want to, I just want to try this until I get it. You right. know, not something. Mm. You know, and I don't want to play what somebody else wrote either. Like, that's I the thing. That it's so, it, like, I had a roommate. He said, um, my style of cooking is uh, the, the name. He found a name for my style of cooking. And he said, the name is why not? You know, <laughs> so if it's in the fridge, it goes like in the pan and we'll see what happens. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think like, for me, um, 
there are some some things where I where I'm more like you, where I just like, you know what? I don't have the time. I can't mm -hmm. be bothered to open the instruction manual for this. I'm just going to tinker with it and figure it out. Yeah. Um, cooking is also one of them for me. I'm not a huge fan of following recipes that much, uh, but then there are certain things where if it's like a very technical thing, like like piano, and in my opinion, piano is actually kind of technical. Right. <laughs> um, or, or like even a language mm -hmm. or something like that. I find learning languages uh, in a similar way. Um, I actually prefer to take classes. I prefer to have someone, a teacher, teach me this thing, you know, in, in the way that I learn best. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's just because of the way I was brought up or, or just how I learn as a person, but I know people, lots of people learn things in different ways, right? But yeah, I'm not the kind yeah. of person who likes structure, yeah. um, which is interesting because I'm an um, artist, but, at, but I'm a classically trained musician. So I think this comes from my classical training yeah. and like that discipline um, plus, you know, I did martial arts for a number of years and we yes. just talked about how you never knew this before about no, me, I didn't. but I just, but yeah, I used, I, I did karate. I did Kyokushin karate for like 10 years growing up. I, I got my black belt when I was young and then I took a break and then I, I went back to karate like a couple of years ago and I just decided to do a competition and I did. <laughs> and then I stopped just before the pandemic. So I was kind of, so anyway, I'm the kind of person who likes this sort of structure and the discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's obvious in a lot of the things that I do. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And one of the, one of the things um, that I always found interesting was that I come from a classical background, but I always wanted to do jazz. And I remember when I was uh, about 20, I guess I started getting interested in learning how to do jazz. And I went, I think I, I went through about five or six different jazz piano teachers because I couldn't find one that could teach me in the way that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting um, because it was like a, a very strange little, little unique position I was in because I was very advanced because of classical, yeah. but such a noob <laughs> for jazz. But, yeah. And I needed someone to teach me in a particular way that I would understand. And they were either way too advanced or way too uh, simple. Like not, it was, it was never just right. So, so now, me as a piano teacher today, I actually get some of these exact students in the same position I was. Because eventually, I figured out the jazz thing. I mean, I'm still not really a jazz pianist. I don't call mm -hmm. myself a jazz pianist, but I do jazz. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a little more comfortable now than I was before, uh, or a lot more comfortable now. Um, and I now teach, so I teach classical, but I also teach jazz. And I find some students fall in the exact same niche position that I was in before. They're super advanced classically, and they would like to learn some jazz. And I'm developing my own method, mm -hmm. my own jazz piano method for classical pianists. Right. Yeah, nice. I'm actually writing a book about it. No way. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is cool. So, but, but then you, you're really yeah. you're taking your own experiences, trying to learn and learning, yeah, uh, and and turning that into yeah. a method so that y somebody can be taught. But you said you went through a number of teachers, yeah. but did you end up with one teacher? Did you find one in the end where you're like, oh, this is this is a good teacher. I'm going to stay with that person, or did you just go through five Never teachers did. and then realize, I guess they taught me enough now, and then you took it on you, you took it yourself from there. Yep. You, so you just took it from there. Yeah. Okay. I took it from there and, um, you know, I did my own research and then I also just sort of played around with things myself and I had, a, I just made, I guess my own understanding of it in a way. Right. Um, and this is what I'm teaching others now. <laughs> so okay. I'm not sure if it's correct or if it's right, but Hey, it kind of works. Yeah. So you know what? Let's go with that. Sure. I and, mean, you know. and to be fair, you know, jazz wasn't even really, was there was no jazz theory before while jazz was being developed yeah. as a style of music, See, the American the jazz style of music, yeah. there wasn't a theory behind it. It was just people who probably didn't even know how to read music yeah. for the most part, just kind of tinkering away on the piano, making it sound jazzy. See, you that's know? the thing. And, uh, it I'm came from same... an inner part of, yeah. I'm thinking the same way with it. Like when so the piano was invented. So it's kind of like a return back to that. Like, yeah. Wasn't it Bach yeah. or uh, like Beethoven or one of these guys mm -hmm. who went, uh, who like entered a room and he mm -hmm. saw this grand piano and he was like, 
holy crap, this is all I want to do from now on, you know? And then like, like among the first people to ever see a piano, they just, what, they, they didn't have teachers. They just sat down and played it, you know? And then they created awesome right. music with it. Exactly. You know? so, exactly. But that's the thing. Theory, so music theory was applied after the music was made. Yeah. Right? It's we, only we, after, I think yeah. people forget that. It's after the fact that people forget somebody that. Like, tries, it's the creative to, process tries to find the system. Yeah. I've, it's the creative it's, process first, which comes out of your taste. Okay, yeah. like there's some certain amount of you need to have like, some experience with it. I mean, everyone learns something from somewhere, yeah. but you, you build on it, and and creativity is built off of what you already know. But it doesn't. It, it's not built off theory. You know, it's built off of your own interpretation, your own aesthetic mm -hmm. um, process, and and the theory and the analysis comes after. When someone else looks at your thing and is like, oh, what they really did was this. And then they, they, yeah. they sort of place they find a that. theoretical yeah. analysis on and then top they of try it to and they make it, it. But I, th I feel like it's yeah. always yes. like the, the greatest things that come out, like the, the greatest works of art that get released uh, are the ones where somebody does it first. You know, like, I mean, of course, there's going to be imitation, like there's going to be um, great music later um, mm -hmm. in the style of that mm -hmm. or great movies in the style of that. But you know how Scream came right. out and it was like this big revolution in 96, right? And it's like this big revolution in the horror movie genre. And everybody was like, oh my God, he's taking it to whole different levels and it's such a smart thing to do. <laughs> and then all the, all the other uh, directors were like, well, I guess that works now. And then they did the same thing without realizing that what was good about Scream right. was that Wes Craven was right. being creative and innovative about it and they weren't they were just plagiarizing what he was mm -hmm. doing and if they were doing it well fair enough you know like they were still feeding the market uh but yeah like right. i feel like somebody comes up with something awesome uh that's because they oftentimes i mean there's no rule there's no you, you can't say that's always like that but oftentimes it's because it was their original vision right yeah 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 yeah, yeah, I find that well, interesting. Well, that's it. A pioneer in a, in a particular, in a new style exactly. should be remembered as the pioneer, you know? And, and then that's, and then from there, there's spinoffs, all kinds of things that develop from there. And then there's fusion and crossovers that happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. In every genre, that's, and that's in, every, another in thing, every art. <laughs> that's another thing I find quite interesting, right? Like the, I, I read that somewhere or I heard that somewhere, like the definition of innovation is you take two things that are already there and then you make another thing out of them that wasn't there before, mm. right? And right. I always, um, right. I default to that example of Linkin Park when they released their first oh, album, yeah. or their first few albums, right? Nobody had done heavy metal and rap before. So right. they, they went ahead and did it, um, right? Right. And I mean, probably other yeah. people had done it before and they were just the first ones to become successful. Let's be real here, right? I guess. Well, uh, but, you was know, it, but they, see, did they come out before Limp Bizkit? Because that Limp Bizkit kind of did the same around thing, the same right? time, right? Yeah. So perhaps, so it was, perhaps the time is right. <laughs> That's a good question. We should, we should, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if I want to look it up now, but yeah, you're right. It could be, it could, could have been them or Limp Bizkit. but yeah, around that time, right. That was a new right. thing. So they all came up, yeah. you know, somebody came up with that and did it. And uh, that was innovation. You know, all of a yeah. sudden there was a new style, you know, exactly. that wasn't there before. Yeah. And um, right. that's, that's awesome. You know, when yeah. something like that so happens. What, what's, can, can you ever tell, can you ever say like what your favorite style of music is? Do you have a favorite style of music? Do I? If n no, <laughs> the short answer is no, but <laughs> there's certainly styles that I like more I had than I a feeling other. you would say that you can't, you can't pin it down. <laughs> yeah, I find it hard to pin down. I, I like to say when people ask me that, I like to say I like good music, you know. So it could be good rap music. It could be like good music. metal, you know, or bad music. And also that's a matter of taste even still, right? Like if I, if I really don't like right. something, somebody's probably going to like it, at least the person who made it. Um, but, you know. Um, you would think. No, would no think. I, could, I, I find it hard to pin down. But if I, if I were to put myself into a corner, it would be the rock slash progressive rock corner. Yeah. So, you know, I, okay. I really love Dream okay. Theater. Cool. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, Rush. Um, I like them and mm -hmm. pink floyd obviously i grew okay. up with pink floyd like my dad was always playing pink floyd even okay. when i was still a kid so like dark side of the moon okay. is like written into my very cool it's like engraved into my mind you know um so, so my that dad corner. was always playing calypso music huh 
my dad was always playing calypso music oh yeah really did you grow did you grow to like yeah. it or did you end up um being getting yeah. tired of it oh now the connection's really it, uh, really bad calypso itself has a you still there continue okay I'm, I'm still here i hear you again yeah well skype is already saying poor connection so okay. uh <laughs> oh no we might uh we can try we, we'll see how Dang. this works now you're back now you're back um it, this way we'll just this this time we'll just push through it there will be periods of poor connection so whatever you know um okay i can hear well, you again. If, it's, you're back. if it's too bad you can just maybe edit it out or something yeah we might we might edit out a little bit um or uh in the end if we might also if the connection becomes uh janky we'll just turn off the camera for a bit and then turn it back on Something like that. But yeah, you're back. You're back. I can hear okay. you again. I can see you again. Um, All right. And you were, I don't Great. remember what you so, were saying. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about Calypso. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. the Calypso music. So I don't, know if you, I don't know much you know about that style of music, but that's, uh, it's sort of like a, a very uh, happy-go-lucky sort of yeah. island type music. Yes. Right. From the Caribbean. My dad's <laughs> from Trinidad. So uh, he grew up with Calypso and... Not so much Soka. Soka kind of came after, but Calypso's like sort of the, the grandfather of Soka. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like the song, you know, Deo, Deo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Daylight come and we want to go home. Like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he would, he would play records of that. Like, I remember we had a record player in my, in my parents' basement. And my dad would just play that mm -hmm. on repeat, you know? And um, anyway, so... It's not that I necessarily grew into Calypso, but I do have an appreciation for, you know, music of music of the sun, mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way, like yeah. reggae music and uh, and soca and, and and Calypso and reggaeton also, yeah. um, and all the all the sort of Latin flavor stuff as well from, I guess South America and also yeah the Caribbean in general, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So I do have an appreciation for it. That's for sure. Nice. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. See, um, same here. I do have an appreciation for that. And uh, there's, a, there's certainly a part of my record or CD collection that has, that comes from that style. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind mm -hmm. is Santana. I have a lot of Santana material. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But I call that Latin rock. That's like Latin rock. You'd no? say so, yeah. Well, it's certainly not Calypso. I mean, that is true. It's certainly not Calypso. It's not Calypso. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Not Calypso. It's not jazz either. No, but lat it, it is Latin. Yeah, Latin rock. Latin rock hits hits that. Yeah, hits the mm. hits the spot. Mm. Um, and then I do. Do you remember Billy Ocean? Like he had a bunch of hits in the eighties. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Get out of my dreams. Uh, get into my car. What What was his biggest single? Uh, he had when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm, European, mm -hmm, Caribbean mm -hmm. Queen, and then, Caribbean Queen. Yeah, no, that was really. Yeah, yeah, totally. He did that one. I love that. Yeah, that he did song. that one. Yeah. I thought that was. Oh, no, okay. no, that's him. That's I love him. that song. Yeah. Um, exactly. Um, I didn't realize he, it was him. Actually, he he has that influence. There's Calypso in there for sure. And this time I'm not uh, I'm not replating right. it with something else. He has one song on his <laughs> 1988 album. Uh, it's called Calypso Crazy, um, and yeah, the music is mm -hmm. that you know. And then he actually just recorded or mm -hmm. released a new album this year, which is nuts. Like the dude's wow. seven, 70 years old and he sounds exactly Amazing. like he did in the eight. Like his voice is in such fine shape. I was really surprised. Wow. And just going through wow. that album That's is amazing. just like a good soulful pop mm -hmm. album, you know, and it's very, it, it has a very sunny, no sunny way. vibe. Very sunny. That's yeah. great. You know, I don't know why. So I live in Montreal. For those of you who don't know, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Montreal. Um, and it's, you know, we're approaching, we're getting close to November here. So things are getting cooler and cooler and the yeah. snow shall come soon. Uh, you live in Germany. I'm assuming it snows there from time to time. It, yeah, it's been getting winter. less, but yeah, it still does sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, so we live in these like somewhat cold kind of countries. And, mm. uh, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm I'm kind of living in the wrong place. Like I feel like I, sh I should be living in a, on a on a beach somewhere. Right. You know, down I south. know. I know. That's where that's where I'm gonna end up at yeah. some point. I sure hope so. Anyway. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Yeah, uh, I can't right wait for what happens. But anyway. <laughs> but you're right. Yeah. yeah, I feel that way sometimes as well. Especially when winter comes, I'm like, 
wait, why am I living here again and not <laughs> on the beach? <laughs> yeah, uh, that would yeah, be so cool. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, there are people who grow up with like I know, the beach I was saying, in, like, uh, in yeah. their backyard. I'm basically. thinking about that. Like sometimes I'm thinking like I, I'm here and like, don't get me wrong. I like where I live. I like Germany. It's It's my home. I feel very comfortable here. And it's a beautiful country. I like living here, you know. Although mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, my mind or my soul, I guess, are international, or at least, mm. or I wouldn't even say international. That goes perhaps a little bit too far. I'm, I'm very Eng English speaking. My soul is very English speaking. Mm. So, and there's not much <laughs> English speaking in Germany, right? Um, I mean, I've created a lifestyle now where about fifty percent of my everyday life are in English because I listen to stuff in English. I, mm -hmm. I watch videos in English. I watch movies mm -hmm. in English. I speak to people who are speaking in English, but uh, so anyway, so yeah, but I feel. Are you born in Germany? I was born and raised here. Yeah, first twenty-seven okay. point something years of my life, I was here. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, um, I'm. So now you're back. And now I'm back. I've been back for two years, give or take. Yeah, two years and two months, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it feels good. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I love were, being here. But when you came, when you came to, you came to Montreal to live, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how long were you in Montreal for? Ten years and nine months. Ten years. Yeah. So were you a time. citizen? You're a Canadian I, citizen. I'm still hoping to become one, but I shot myself in the foot pretty badly with that. Oh, okay. I don't know if did I tell you that story? Oh right. Uh, I think I, I probably remember, did. I think I'm, yes, I think I remember it's, the story. It's coming back I to think you I remember now. The story. <laughs> Uh, I, I might as well. I don't know if you want to share on, on the podcast, but <laughs> yeah, I might as well just embarrass myself a little bit on this podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, seriously, I mean, I was just say it didn't work out. <laughs> it's well, it still might. There's still a chance. Um, I'm yeah. I was in Montreal for ten years, right? So the first mm -hmm. six, seven years, I think, seven years, I was a temporary. I had a te had a work permit because the company that hired me, Babel, or keywords now. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a great mm -hmm. company. I really enjoy being there. Um, it's a young, dynamic company. What they mm -hmm. do is they test video games. So I was in the video game right, testing, right, right. right? I was a tester for a year or so. And then um, I, I rose to uh, the position of project lead. And mm -hmm. they were like, hey, do you want a contract? And I was like, do I? Yeah, I do. Give it. <laughs> um, and nice. before then, I was on a work and travel. I was only supposed to go. I was only planning to go to Montreal for a year. And then I, <clears throat> they were like, hey, here's a contract. And I was like, sure, uh, bring it on. And so they took care of my work permit. So then for the next six years, okay. until 2015, I was there as a, uh, as a temporary worker with a permit. And then in 2015, right, right. I decided, okay, I might as well just become a permanent resident. And that's what I am still today. Um, yeah. And then when I left, okay. I had been in Montreal for more than 10 years and more than five years as a permanent resident. So wow. I, um, I overqualified already to become a citizen. And mm -hmm. I said to myself, well, I'm, right. you know, I feel, I feel so connected to Canada and I have business connections there now as well. I have, of course, mm -hmm. my personal connections, I have my friends, but I still have clients in Canada. I still have business mm -hmm. there and I don't want to lose that. I don't want to, uh, you know, stop mm -hmm. working for Canadian clients. So that's why mm -hmm. I applied for citizenship. And I said, um, well, here are my reasons, right? And you need mm -hmm. to do a couple of things, actually. Um, when you, if you want to become a German and Canadian citizen, if you want to, if you want to have dual mm -hmm. citizenship, you need to get a paper from the German government saying, okay, that's cool. He can keep, he can keep the German one and become a Canadian. If you don't do that, the day you become a Canadian citizen or any other citizen of any other country, your German citizenship just automatically expires. Like, no questions oh, wow. asked if you don't get that paper. And it's right. funny because I went to my hometown and um, I talked to, I went to my hometown to the office that, that gives papers and that because I needed to get a new ID card. And I just mentioned in passing, oh yeah, I'm also trying to become a Canadian citizen. And the woman was like, hey, um, but you got, your, you got that paper, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah I have that. And she was like, good, because um, I have people sitting here in front of me regularly and I have to tell them, well, you're no longer a German now. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, wow. And it took me five <laughs> minutes to Google that, you know. Um, but yeah, so yeah. And I, I'm rambling. I'm, I'm, I'm going off on tangents. But I, so I got invited to oh, do a, an exam, uh, the citizenship <laughs> exam. I like tangents. <laughs>
Um, in March 2019, I got my first invitation to do the exam. And mm -hmm. what they did, I was expecting it to, uh, them to send that invitation to my lawyer. who I, I have a lawyer in Montreal who's taking care of immigration, mm -hmm. all that thing for me. So what they did instead, and I wasn't prepared for that, they sent it to my email address. And of course, it went straight into the spam folder. And I wasn't looking. I wasn't oh, paying man. attention, you know, so I missed it. And I just, I, I didn't go. I didn't go to Montreal to do the uh, the first right. exam. Then the, they gave me a second chance mm -hmm. in June, July 2019. And I didn't go because I had uh, surgery for my hernia. So mm -hmm. there went that. Mm. At least that time, it wasn't my fault. You know, it, it, there was nothing to be done about right. it. And then they gave me a third chance in January, which is why I was in Montreal. I flew to Montreal and... This is really, really fucked up. It's one of the stupidest things I've done in my entire life. I didn't just shoot myself in the foot. I sawed my foot off. I went to the exam 20 minutes late. I, I, was, I was there at 9. It was at 8.30. And I thought it was at 9.30. So all, out of all the things I prepared, I read, the, I, I, I read all the things I needed to read, like the, the study guide oh and gosh. everything. I was so well prepared. I, was, I took care of everything. I booked the flight. I flew to Montreal. I did all that. And then I didn't double check the <laughs> stupid time when it was supposed to start. So I came too late. And yeah, they were like, Yikes. sorry, man, it's, uh, it's over. Like you're, you were supposed to be here 20 minutes ago. Uh, goodbye. Go home. And so now I'm trying to get a fourth chance. <sighs> You know, and in the meantime, I needed well, to get I, another one of those German yeah. papers. I needed to get a second one of those because the first one expired in the July this year. <laughs> so I just got that and I have oh, it gosh. and I, I got it. I got a new PR card as well. So I'm at least a permanent for okay. another five, permanent resident for another five years. Um, although that PR card, that's right. another, another, that's another crazy thing. That's the last thing I'm going to tell. And then you can talk. Again. <laughs> uh, but then you know what happened? You, you, you did this, Melina. You brought this on yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I, I happened? find this uh, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, what happened, actually, um, I, my PR card expired, my permanent resident card expired on May 11th this year, and now it's mm -hmm. uh, late October. And so I applied for a new one while I was still in Montreal. The last day before I left Montreal in January, I sent off the application for a new one. And then they sent it to my Canadian address, which is my lawyer's address at this point, um, because I don't have mm -hmm. a, a home address in Canada at the moment. Um, so they sent it there. And then now it's lying in my, in my Canadian immigration lawyer's desk drawer. And I'm in Germany. And technically, I'm supposed to pick it up uh, in person. Like, I'm not supposed to get it outside the country but now i'm i'm not really sure how we're going to solve that we don't know yet because i can't get back into the country because my pr card expired there's a global pandemic. and there's a global pandemic uh, i was supposed to pick it up i was supposed to fly in and pick it up in person but then the pandemic happened and uh i it was too dangerous to fly so it's it's in it's up yeah. in the air right now um we'll see what happens right. next and uh fingers crossed you know knock on wood we'll we'll see what happens i don't know yet um, but I'm still yeah. hoping, you know, I would love to be yeah, a, a yeah. Well, I, I wish you luck in this ongoing saga. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's that story. OK, back to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think immigration things are, are can be can be very complex. Yeah, they right? can. From what I from what I see, from what, I'm, from what I hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've heard stories yeah. from other friends. And, uh, and you know, but it's but it, it's so it's so I find it so brave, you know, for people to do that kind of thing. Like you're born in one place, in one part of the world, and then you just, you just sort of one day pick up this and say, you know what? I want to go to that mm. country on that side of the world and and make a life, you know, or at least start a just life or, or do something there. different yeah, exactly. for a period of time. And yeah. I feel like that's that's a really brave thing to do. I've never really done that. The, the, the closest thing I had to that was when I went for for six months to South Korea. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? I don't know if you, if you remember that but i uh, i went for, do, for a few yeah. months to south korea to play in a hotel that was when i had my big life change actually right. um because i was going from a purely corporate life to an you know to yeah. never mind i'm gonna i'm gonna quit my job i'm going to leave the boyfriend at 
Mm. And I'm going to just go and become a traveling musician and go and play in Korea. I left my apartment. I got rid of everything and like wow. went to South Korea. Yeah, you did. At it's the time true. When, they, when North Korea was 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 um, threatening missiles, you know, and there was a lot of uh, tension with the North Korea and everything. That's exactly the moment I went. <laughs> Melina, was that um, was that palpable? In, yes. When you were in South Korea, was that palpable? That threat was it in the air? Did you feel it? The threat with North Korea, barely not. Okay. Barely. So it wasn't the papers, nobody but no, but people were much. So they were going about it their daily business. It was more. Yeah. Yeah, it was more of a problem to, like North America. North Americans were considering it like, oh my God, it's such a dangerous place. South Koreans were just like going about the. It was business as usual. Yeah. It was business as usual. The only thing is that, but on the other hand, I was stationed in Busan, which is in the southern part of the. The country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful, very modern, actually, it's a very modern and also very ancient city at the same time along the water. Yeah. Um, I did travel at one point to Seoul, which is more north, and it, Seoul is actually closer to the border with North Korea. And there, there were, first of all, more um, non Koreans, so more foreigners actually living and stationed there and working there. And there was a military military presence mm. okay there was mm. a there was a u.s military presence in Nor in uh, seoul when i was there um so and then you you'd hear a bit more talk about the tension between north america uh, north korea and uh, south korea yeah. but where i was in busan which is actually the second largest city of the country people didn't really care right like yeah. really you know and i mean for for very, the u.s i guess very it, little. it makes sense for the u.s to be to be concerned about that because they do have a close relationship with South Korea, right? Like you say, there's military presence, yes. um, and yes. I'm sure there's there's a lot of like business dealings and stuff that they have with South Korea. You know, there's a there's probably an economic relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just spitballing here. Yeah. I could look it up, but I'm <laughs> yeah. I, I'm guessing yeah, that that's look probably it up later. yeah exactly. Um, I'm not I'm not that well informed, yeah. but I do know that there's there's a close relationship of some sort between the countries. Don't ask me more right. about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's just North North Korea was on the was on the uh, was on the do not uh, like don't don't consort with North Korea. <laughs> list, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> and then Trump was like, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll do it anyway. Well, you know, now now we don't we barely hear about North Korea now. Now everything's about yeah. The pandemic. You know? Yeah, it's and, true. Uh, China. And even before and, the pandemic, we didn't hear much. We don't hear so much about North Korea. Yeah. But it you kind wonder, of, kind right? of faded away. Yeah. yeah, it kind of faded away. And I mean, like, how serious should you take the threat mm -hmm. as, you know, because it is probably a pretty big threat, you know, if the dude uh, flips, you know, he could, he could do some damage. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if any leader flips, that could do damage, right? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, there's, there's people so. with a shorter and longer fuse. <laughs> and he's definitely sure. on the shorter side. Sure. You know, his, his fuse, let's just put it that right, way, right, is pretty right. short, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you catch my drift. Oh, well, anyway. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I was wondering, why don't, you know what, I'm going to go into one of my prepared questions, because why not? <laughs> sure. Um, why not? Let's let's actually do some questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've been chatting and bumbling no, about but for this about has an been, hour. <laughs> this is, you know what? This is exactly what I wanted yeah, this great. to be. Like th so far, this has been fantastic. I'm really happy with the way we, we're good. We're talking, you know, and yeah. uh, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that listeners are still here, still listening. <laughs> right. Probably yeah. listeners are like, oh, we're going to see what the what, stats are. Like, how many people dropped off after a couple? Yeah, I'm going to see the stats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone makes it out to this to this to this far <laughs> yeah at this yeah. point they're like yeah <laughs> you know what matt's right why am i still listening <laughs> i just jinxed it no um but you know we'll see um <laughs> but it's funny like i mean i'm i'm my my youtube channel is really at this point it's just really really small nobody's really watching anything you know i put one video out there the other day uh which was about uh, a graphics filter that I use, or a graphics shader that I use in a retro in, in Retro Arch, which is a gaming platform where you can play all kinds of retro games, right? And I was so proud, uh, not proud. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so happy with that filter, and nobody else has talked about it before of that shader, which is basically an mm -hmm. upscaling filter. You remember how, like in the '90s, games had like pixelated graphics, and so now you can mm -hmm. you can play with shaders that that um, 
upscale these graphics. You, there's also shaders that just replicate the mm. look of an old CRT TV. But this shader was one that is really good at upscaling and just like you don't see the edges, the jagged edges of the pixels because the shader smooths okay. it, you know, and just turns it into like ah. clear lines, you know. And um, right, so right, I right. did a video about that and I made sure that, you know, the terms shader and retroarch and XBRZ and like some terms that people were likely to look up were in the um, title of the video. So I made, I, I it was sort of an experiment. Right. I put that video out there, first of all, to talk about the shader because nobody else has yet, but also to see if I put these yeah. in and then how many views am I going to get. And then this has yeah. been out for a few weeks, uh, three weeks yeah. or something, and I got like 60 views, which for my um, for my channel is, is already a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I do have a few videos oh, that okay. have a couple thousand views. Uh, but mostly right. if I re if I had to release a video, it gets like seven views or something, you know. Right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, it depends. I mean, okay, so this is this is this is the social media yeah. like uh, strategy, mm -hmm. right? And, That's the strategy. You throw about... stuff at a wall and see what sticks, right? You just Well, yeah, but also you have to there's so many things to look at, right? Like yeah. who is your who is your target Who's audience? Your audience? Yeah, why you are know, they coming what's to what's a good number? what's a good number for someone putting out videos with the content that you're putting out? You know, like That's there's the so many things involved. Like is your video the right length? Is the content interesting? Is the content relevant? There you have it. Um, yeah. You know, are you a good talker? I, I would imagine you are, but these are all questions that can help determine how many views a video gets. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. And then the other thing too is like, well, how are people finding your video? Yeah. Right. What are they typing in? And like in? you said, you were using you're using uh, you're using keywords, which is great. I try to target you know? it. Yeah. Keywords and target words and things like that. Yeah. And that's great. But usually that's that's not all it takes either. Like, no. you know, do you have already a following? Yeah. Is your following the people, the same people who'd be interested in this particular video? Exactly. Because you know, if you're going to put, like, for example, this podcast on your on your YouTube channel, you know, that might be in, in clash with your um, exactly. with your it's, it's review something of, of, totally the different, of the technical right? stuff, you know? So I'm, I'm also... So you might want to create two different YouTube channels, actually. I might, exactly. That's what I was thinking as well. you want to build two audiences. Um, but I think I'm, like, in yeah. the long run, I do want to it's build one thing. audience. Um, I'm just... Right now, I'm trying different things. I mean, my, my YouTube channel is Brand Artery. Sure. So basically, it's the YouTube channel of my web design business. So technically, right. not even this but then podcast. Your web design has nothing much to do with that. That exactly, that it has nothing to do. About, nothing right? to do with gaming, on the surface of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, both is done on computers, you know. So there's something a little bit to do with it. It's a loose uh, but connection. I mean, you know, it's a loose connection. Somebody, somebody who runs yeah. a website might be nerdy and might be into games. So you know, I'm thinking I'm not straying too far off the uh, the the thing that I'm talking about. Um, but also this podcast, right, right mm -hmm. isn't necessarily, I mean, we're not talking about web design or if we do, it's by a coincidence, right? Um, so right. even this podcast is about, like the way I'm justifying this podcast is that as at, <laughs> at, 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 um, at heart, I'm a storyteller. Like I want to use what I do to tell stories about people. Um, so my websites, I want to mm -hmm. present somebody. I want to tell somebody a story through that right. website. You know, so that's a medium that I use. And then this podcast is another medium that I use to tell stories, right? And here it's very obvious yeah. how that, yeah. you know, we're telling your story right now, or we're talking about who you are and what you've been doing and what you do in, in life, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's about storytelling. And so, and, and that's certainly at the core of what I do as a business person as well, storytelling. Mm -hmm. Visual storytelling, mm -hmm. also through my photography, right? Telling stories through photos. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the reason I gave that whole prelude uh, to like, uh, so this video got 50 something views and then that, that was something where I'm like, okay, um, I targeted that video. I, I know there's an audience of, for that video. I knew that beforehand and I knew that people mm -hmm. were going to probably type this, uh, type the term shader retro arch and find my video, you know? So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, that's as, as expected. And I'm still, I'm very happy that I have around 60 views in a few weeks, right. which is not a lot. Let's be let's be real. But for me, it is it is a good success. I'm happy with that, you know. Um, sure. But here's what surprises me: the video, the podcast with Ricky, which is two hours and fifty one mm -hmm. minutes, uh, has almost has more views than that video. Huh. Um, in I think one more week, one one week more. Yeah, I think it's four weeks old. And 
granted, I, I told some people about it. I told my friends and family and some of them watched it. Yeah. But I would say on the whole, I told 10 people. So having 50, okay. and like, let's say everybody clicks, every time somebody watch, clicks on the video, that's counted as a view. So let's say these people right. click, like each of them click three times to go through the whole thing in, 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 in installments. Then that still means somebody found my video, that podcast mm -hmm. with Ricky, that two and a half hour podcast, and wasn't turned off by the fact that it said two and a half hours or two hours uh, 51 and still started watching that podcast. And that surprises yeah. me. And I'm really, really happy and grateful uh, to anybody watching this right now. I'm grateful. Like, I'm, yeah. you know, to me, this podcast, the reason I'm doing this is because I feel, especially now in the times of Corona, um, we need to have, we need to have an exchange between each other. We need to have conversations, right? Um, I also want to yeah. help establish empathy i want to help show what people think and what they're about you know um, because somebody you pass mm -hmm. by in the street has a whole kind of perspective and view of the world that might be different from yours and you could learn something from that as a listener you know or you could find inspiration yeah. at least you, know, you don't have to change your life now because you listen to melina but yeah you know um <laughs> yeah anyway that's that's sort of my yeah. rambling about that no, yeah, yeah. I was going to well, you ask know, you something. Talking about, talking about views of, on yeah. YouTube and stuff like that. So I'll give you uh, an example of like the discrepancy between my own music and someone else's music. Yes. So I did um, at one point in 2017, I think I did a video um, of me performing a, a cover of, of Seal's Kiss from a Rose. Yeah, you did that. Beautiful right, that video. That song from like the 90s. And, uh, you know, I just I put out that video I had actually made that video really as a as a demo. I wanted to show people what I can do, vo just voice and piano uh, for for like a nice cover, a song that I really like. Mm -hmm. um, but that view has something like seventeen thousand view. Th that video has something like seventeen thousand views, and I'm just like, all the rest of my stuff, which is older, has you know maybe a couple of thousand like mm -hmm. max. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, mm -hmm. wow. I guess you know that's the power of of putting out something with names or words that Absolutely. artists that people recognize Absolutely. you know and i mean not all people have given me likes i actually have some dislikes i'm like ah! kind of like <laughs> yeah. pulls on my heartstrings a little bit but i'm like how dare you not like what i do uh, but you know people are entitled to, to their own opinions of course i suppose <laughs> um i guess and you know that's just that's just part of what it is so yeah. so you know I don't know if people are clicking on it just because they're like, oh, here's another, here's a song I really like, and here's an artist I don't know, and I'm, let, me, let me watch her do it. Mm -hmm. Or they're literally, it's also possible that YouTube is uh, auto playing it, right? Because there's an algorithm behind could be, YouTube yeah. that is, um, that, you know, plays a video that it thinks you're going to enjoy based on your previous viewings. Yeah. So that's another way you could, you could be getting, going up in the views too. And I think, I think it kind of snowballs. If you have a good video, there's a certain like critical moment where, um, it kind of keeps building on its own without yeah. you having to actively search for new audience. I was going to say that once you once you cross that threshold, and that that is also going to like if you're really lucky, that's going to end up lifting all your other material, because then like at, yeah. at a certain point, at a, if you reach a tipping point, um, then people are going to click on your channel and be like, "What else is she doing?" And then they 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 listen yeah. to your other stuff. Exactly. Like you want to reach exactly. that, that that point. You want to get there. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know where that point is, but... Yeah, it's probably different <laughs> anyway, for everybody, Anyway, it seems to be a moving target, too, because I think there's so much material out there on YouTube yeah. that, you know, to try to cut through the clutter is a little bit... It's a, it's a, it's tricky. It's and true, every once in a yeah. while, I go through my, you know... Actually, I just recently, during this pandemic, um, had time to go through, you know, old YouTube videos and things that other people have put up, especially my mom, but <laughs> things that my mom has put up about <laughs> me, um, which were not always the best performances. And I just kind of went through and I had, to, I, I had to just, you know, be like, okay, I had to put my foot down and say, you know what, these ones need some to be removed of, because it's to not, go. it's not, yeah, it's just not, it's not showing me at my best. And, you know, that was me five years ago, or that was me eight years ago. And mm -hmm. like, now I'm at a mm -hmm. different level, or I don't do this these songs in this way anymore and things like that you know and like it's you got to clean the clutter at some point and digital clutter is a thing it is digital a thing. clutter it totally is, is a yeah. thing and it, it it's I'm, yeah i'm it's, decluttering it's my way, facebook right now <laughs> it's the same way you make a mess on in your room you know in your, in your house that's the same yeah. way you make a mess on computers or your youtube channel or anywhere right like if you keep if yeah. you keep like if you keep things tidy and neat uh you're probably better off 
Yeah, but that's the thing. I think I think you know it's, it's so important today. If you're any kind of a public person, yeah, um, um, or you have a business or something like that, you need to have a consistent messaging. Absolutely. And your messaging. I mean, you're allowed to evolve as a person, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, at any point, at some point, you need to go back and 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 Evaluate. clear clear out the old. You know, you gotta make space for the new. You gotta keep only the top notch stuff. You know, like it's not always necessarily worth it to hold on to the past too much. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm I'm learning that. I mean, I'm I'm quite good at letting go of the past. I'm like I'm I'm kind of like. You know what? Let's let's make space for the new, and let's make sure that people don't find the past when it's not that good. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I'm speaking about my own music. I'm speaking about my own I'm you actually, know, older videos that I've done, things like that. That brings to mind a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you look back on your on your work, what you've released so far, and in, in terms of these three albums, um, yeah. is there is there anything where you go back and you like it makes you cringe? You're like, wait, uh, what, what did I write back then? Or would, uh, yeah. did I really do this? Like, is there a yeah. song there where you're like, Ugh, I don't to know, be, man. I'll be very honest with you, and this is probably many artists' experience. I generally don't like anything I do oh, after, really? when it's been too long. Yeah. So I'm always... Because you change, because you evolve. Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised when I go back and listen to something I haven't listened to in a few years or something like that. Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised for certain aspects of, let's say, a particular song. But most of the time I'm like, ooh, I kind of cringe anyway. I'm like, you know what? I wish I could have sung that better. I wish I could have performed mm -hmm. that better and or recorded that better or something. <clears throat> like there's always I'm I'm quite critical. Yeah. I'm quite critical of myself. But we I all think are, that though. that's not necessarily a bad thing because it just makes me want to do better next time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And so it's right still now, out there as a as a testament to where you come from you've come from, right? Yeah. And it's you know, it's it's fun to look back and be like, ha, remember that song? Song I did when I was 22. <laughs> what a cute thing, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, it's kind of nice as a historical sort of like autobiographical, mm, you know, memory. Yeah. I guess um, it's nostalgic a little bit. But generally, I'm excited for the future or for what I'm working on presently. Mm. I'm 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 rarely excited by like very like proud of myself for something I did in the past. Like as soon as it's been, I go through and I go through cycles. And I think it's a very artistic thing. I think most artists do this. I'm, I'm excited when I write something. I'm excited when it when it gets when I record it. I'm excited when I first put it out, right. and then I get depressed because it's like, oh. Oh, okay, well now I'm just noticing all the now I'm noticing all the errors and all the parts I could have done better. And I know, this, that, you know. But nobody else and, will, you know. Nobody. And then I put it away, and then I put it away for a bit, and then when I come back to it, I might get excited again because I'll be like, oh, actually that wasn't so bad. Was that? But then you know, it's it's up and down. Was that experience what made you re-record New Face? For example. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So. Because uh, you uh, felt. But actually, that was also because. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I forget what I was going to say, but I think I think that was also because I needed an extra song on the album. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> why don't I just take this song? Because I think I think it could be done better. You okay. Know? So I needed an extra song on the album to you know to get the full album length, but also. Um, you know, also I trusted that because I was working with a different producer. So the first album was with one guy who was more of a electronic. He had more of an electronic background, electronica. Right. He was into like drum and bass and uh, things like that. Not that there's any drum and bass on that album, but it definitely has an electronic component, an electronic feel to to the to the production. Mm -hmm. um, and my second album was done by a rock guy. So he's a gotcha. Montreal rock artist, right? And the albums right? you so can his totally tell treatment of the vocals and. You can tell, like, you can tell. there's more guitar, it's more acoustic instruments, um, things like that. So it definitely has a, the, the producer really can change the, the feel of an album, like, mm. enormously, but, right? I mean, so the way I saying... looked at it is... Okay, go. Cool. Yeah. But I'm going to keep it at that oh, sorry, question okay. well, What I was just going to say is, like, the way I was looking at it is, like, you know what? Um, the first album was kind of like an EP. It was just like, it was only six songs. And yeah, it's like 20 it something was minutes. sort of an experiment. It was sort of like me dipping into it. Um, but my second album was really my first full length album. So I was right. considering that almost like, okay, this is my sound. This is my direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to re record that one song because I was like, you know what? It's a good song. And let's see what this guy can do to, to bring it to a different level. And I was That's happy it. with it. Um, I like both versions, actually, in their own way. <laughs> but, 
But now I'm looking back at the second album and thinking, well, that wasn't really my style either. So now I'm going to change it up again. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I'm going with the fourth album. I, yeah. yeah. You know what? I, that's that's the question I was going to ask you. Um, where are you going to go mm -hmm. with the next album? Like, are you are you taking another yet another complete um Well, it's not a complete left turn. I wouldn't say the previous albums have been complete left turns. There's certainly consistency between album one and two. I mean, album three, the jazz album, is a different album, clearly. That was different, yeah. Um, but yeah. the first two, you can tell they're, they're well-produced pop albums, whereas the first one is mm -hmm. more on the dancey side. There's more electronica in mm -hmm. there. And the second one is more mm -hmm. on the rocky side. But you can still tell it's originally mm -hmm. new. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm expecting or I'm, I'm suspecting that the next album will also still carry your signature very, very clearly. Um, but it's going to you... carry my signature more than the third album, for sure, because the third for album sure. was kind of a, it, it was kind of a I'm not going to say a commercial decision, but it was sort of um, it was like an inevitable uh, direction that I, I felt like I needed to do to do it justice because I was getting, you know, I'm a pop artist, I guess by nature yeah. but because i'm a pianist and i sing um and i started getting hired to do all these jazz shows all over the city i really became known as a jazz artist right just by virtue of of, of performing so much in jazz venues and so it was it became uh a little bit problematic when people would come see my show and i'd be doing a, a jazz show like full-on dan across style jazz show mm. um and they'd be like oh can i buy your album and they're like is it what we heard tonight and i'd be like no it's my original material oh. and they'd be like oh oh crap okay yeah. and then sometimes people were like okay well i'll support you and they would buy it and that's great and other times people were like oh well we really want to hear more of what you did tonight and it's like okay so it was a decision that you know what maybe i should just since i perform jazz all the time yeah. it would make sense for me to have a jazz album people can take a part of it home with them mm. and they show their appreciation in that way and i do like jazz too i'd never thought about doing a jazz album before but uh in 2018 i just decided you know what i'm gonna do this and put it out and when i do my jazz shows it's the appropriate album to be selling at those shows right. and it's still me it's still me doing it like it's still songs that i perform you know for sure and i went with some of the best jazz musicians of montreal uh for, for that yeah and you can tell album. i mean the whole album is very jazz... expertly done yeah it's yeah very very well done <laughs> yeah and it was the fastest it was so fast we were done in two days two i days. know right that's all you, it took. you didn't do any tracks like right? you didn't do any um it we was recorded, recorded live right i yeah. think you said it was yeah, in it was the studio like the all the like they all had their different studio like different rooms in the studio yes. all the musicians yes but everybody was yes. playing at the same time and they could hear each other yeah so we right. had this really sophisticated system where we had cameras Yeah. And TV screens in every in every um, booth, mm -hmm. and we had five musicians. It was a quintet, so every five musicians, we all had our ear earphones on, and we were all playing at the same time, and watching each other through cameras or through uh, uh, windows, mm -hmm. because actually it was kind of like a circle of rooms, of like five rooms, like like a penta, a pentagon, <laughs> I gotcha. guess. Yeah. And uh, we were all like watching each other through uh, windows or through screens. So mm. it was uh, it was very interesting how it was done. It was done so quickly because we just did like a couple of takes of the same of the songs. Right. And it's all standards that people generally know. I mean, we had a couple of rehearsals beforehand. A couple, like not, not a lot, <laughs> just a couple. We had a couple of rehearsals beforehand and then we just went to the studio. It was done. It was so fast. It was so fast. It's yeah. very different from the experience of an original album where, you know, I might come up with the skeleton of the song, piano and voice, and like that's all I have. But I got to bring it to a producer afterwards who's going to help me arrange it, add instrumentation, um, you know, add some back vocals, this and that. There's a lot more that goes into producing an original album, especially if it's not just piano and voice, um, than, than a jazz album. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I, I can't tell you where the direction of my next album is going, but you heard a little bit. You heard a little sample of it, yeah. right? Right now, the, the piano and voice skeleton of one of the tunes. What I'm I guess actually, it's going to be more along that direction, but there's no instruments yet in that one. Cool. Um, what I'm There actually proposing is um, we're now about an hour and, what, 15 minutes in? I guess with uh, if you add the little bit of banter that we had before we started recording. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we take a quick break here? And um, mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to splice in your rough vocal take that you sent me. Uh, oh no, so, really? Okay, all right. So for, the, cool. for listeners, you're now going to listen to a beautiful five-minute song that uh, Melina is working on. And this is, a, this is a, an early yes. cut. 
But do you want to yes. say a little bit about it? Keep in it? mind, this is version one, version this one, version, version one. not even version one. It's version like zero. It's not, right. not version one yet. There will be a proper version in the future. But it already yeah. sounds really good. It's uh, it's, it's well you. it's well recorded. It sounds good. Um, <sighs> and I'm I'm gonna be excited to put it in to put it into the podcast at okay. this point. Also, All I right. think at a later point, or perhaps even um, well, probably not the points that we've done so far. But I'm. With your permission, I might throw in one or two other songs as well. Sure. Just to give people sure. an idea of like what yeah. what does Melina do? Like perhaps a representative okay. song of each of the three albums. Okay, um, that sounds cool. But now let's go with the song. Do you want to give us a quick introduction? Tell us the, the title. Tell okay. us what the song is about. Okay, so um, <laughs> I guess we're going to be going with Drowning, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the, the song, the sample that I sent to, to Matt, uh, I guess a few days ago, is, the song is called Drowning. It's actually a song I wrote very recently during this pandemic time. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's really kind of an unfortunate situation that I found myself in. Uh, I was in a relationship where the person, my partner, the person that I was with in this relationship with, was a little bit overbearing, like too much so. Controlling, really. To the point where you feel like you're drowning and you're... You don't, you feel like you can't get out and you feel like you're stuck. Mm. And so it's kind of, uh, it's very, it's very emotional song. And, um, and yeah, that's what it's about. So hopefully right. people can not, re I don't want people to relate to it, but, but if they do, I hope it helps them. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So you and I are going to take a quick break. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and I'm going to have, I'm also uh, like every time I stop the recording, I'm like, Thank God the first file is done and saved. Like I'm always waiting for the moment right. where the computer craps out and then the file is checkpoint. broken. <laughs> but at this checkpoint, we have the first half of the recording. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Great. Um, and we're going to be, okay. if you want to go to the bathroom or anything, get, go nuts. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> we'll be back in a <laughs> <laughs> I'll go nuts in the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to get wrong. another coffee is what I'm going to do. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then we'll reconvene in just a little bit, in two or three minutes. Um, okay. And, you want to call me back then? No, we'll leave the call open. Just leave it like oh, it is. We'll leave it on. And then okay. I'll just start Sounds recording good. again in, in a bit. Okay, so you guys okay. enjoy the song and we'll be back in a little bit. So long. All right. Shadows 
<laughs> let's see, let's see. Yeah it's, yeah, it's recording. Okay, so very nice, very good. Um, I hope everybody liked the song. <laughs> and um, I actually want to... Like, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah, from this point on, um, I, I, have, I have a few ideas of how we're going to do the rest of this podcast. Um, I want to... I mentioned this before we okay. went into this break. I want to take the opportunity to showcase another few of your songs. And the way I want to do this is mm. I want to talk about a few subjects. Um, and in between, we're just going to take these breaks and we're going to say, okay, this is a good, we're going to cut here and we're going to just pick a song from each of the albums. You and I are going to do that together that we're going to play. Cool. And you say a little bit about it, just like you did just now with, with okay. the new song, right? And um, okay. so for each album, we're going to have a representative song. Um, but okay. For now, we're just going to start have talking. Have to think about that. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. no, don't 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 think about it too hard. You'll think about it when I ask the question. <laughs> All right. Um, so the first question I have now that we're we're back. Um, why don't we stick with the subject of dating? Although I don't even know where we're going to take that. I don't <laughs> even know where that's going to be. But we might as well just be, uh... stay there for a moment because that's sort of what we were talking about just now. Um, right? You you were going through yeah. a breakup. Um, yes. And, uh, during a global pandemic, may I? During a global this? pandemic. During a global pandemic. Which, not easy. Which not is easy not an to, easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, do you yeah. want to? Do you want to talk about that? Um, do you want to? I mean, yeah, a little bit, I guess. Yeah. This might this, this might turn into a therapy session. So just, exactly. <laughs> just let's, so let's you do know. this. Uh, I mean, well, actually, how much do you want to know? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was a I short mean, relationship. This, yeah. And, in the grand scheme I remember of things. You I mean, it was only the... like a, a year or so. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I had met this person, um, I guess I'm just going to go just quick snapshot. I, I met this person on vacation, mm -hmm. uh, last summer and, uh, he, he's not from Montreal. Mm -hmm. He's from France actually. And, uh, I mean, essentially it felt like a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. It felt like a fairy tale. Um, 
it was like we met, it's like we pretty much immediately fell in love. It's like kind of that kind of situation. Um, he came to, to, to visit me in Montreal. He ended up staying in Montreal um, because things were going well. And he was like, well, I could take a leave of absence from my job in France. And, oh, I can, you know, we can see how this goes. And that. So we essentially moved in like right away, which should have been my first clue. Um, but anyway, things were going well at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And everything's always rosy at the very beginning. Of course. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, and I was asking you, all these questions about your immigration uh, situation yourself, because I was kind of in a way going through that with this person as mm -hmm. well, because we were trying to find I ways for him to like immigrate that. to Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were like, okay, well, there's only really three ways. You either study in Canada, you work in Canada, or you get married. Yeah. And so we were like, well, maybe we should get married. It was going so well that I was considering that option. Um, good thing we didn't though, in yeah. the end. Yeah. Um, so we ended up pulling the plug Dodge on that idea. And then also the pandemic hit. So yeah. it was kind of like, you know, a lot of things all at once. And uh, us being, at the end of the day, we didn't really know each other that well, right? Even though I thought we did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there were these problems that crept up little by little. But I was kind of stuck with him because he was staying in my house, you know, like living with me. And... Um, and it was just, it just became problematic. And like, like I mentioned before about the song, he became somewhat controlling. He became somewhat overbearing to the point where I realized maybe I might've made a mistake and this wasn't the person that I should be with. Um, and it, and it ended quite badly with basically me, kick, me kicking him out of my house and no, the country right. <laughs> like at the same time. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that, so that was a very, it was like one of those super intense relationships, mm. fireworks, you know, what they call love bombing mm. at the beginning and then literally bombing like by the end. Love bombing um, and then bombing. That okay. I would say that was probably my fastest, my fastest rise and fall in a relationship that I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and I learned a lot mm -hmm. and I will never do that again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, when it comes to relationship, I mean, I guess we all live with some regrets. Who doesn't? Um, but do you, would you say like, if you look back on, on past relationships, are there a lot of things you regret mm -hmm. where you're like, God, I wish I hadn't done that. Or is it mostly, well, the relationships were good at the time and they ran their course and, you know, like how, how do you experience I mean, that? Uh, yeah. I've been asking my, I mean, this is what, this is what I need therapy for. <laughs> so thanks for being my, thanks for being my therapist today. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been asking myself these questions for yeah. a while now because I've, I've been through several uh, long-term relationships, longish term, like, you know, three, four, five-year relationships um, with some, you know, single time in between them. And, you know, I've, I've fallen in love that many times. Like, I guess five, five, six times I've fallen in love. And I each time I thought that person was the one for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I will have to say that for the most part, the, the relationships probably weren't right from the beginning. And my only mistake was letting, was letting them keep going okay. for too long. Yeah. I think that was a mistake actually. Um, but it's because, you know, and we can go into so many topics about this, but I think as, as women, um, especially when you're getting older, mm. like I'm over 30 now, mm. surprise, <laughs> every, you know, you, you start to feel this pressure, like, oh, you need to, you know, figure things out and get your life in order and this yeah. and that. I don't and envy I think you guys. guys. Go through a certain amount of, I think guys go through a certain amount of that kind of pressure yeah. too, but I think it's way well, it's stronger. For me, for me, it's mostly this. For women. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, that's what hair. the hat's for. <laughs> that's now what the I get for. it. <laughs> I started planning early. <laughs> that's what the hat's for. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I but think no, women. I get, what, I get what you're saying. We all go through yeah. these things. Like you're, you're like, wait, I get older, and what, what if, what if, what if, what if, you know? Well, you know, I think also it's it's exacerbated by the times we live in. You know, social media doesn't help when all of your high school friends have are basically going through their first divorces and getting onto their second marriages oh, now Jesus. already. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, and meanwhile, I haven't even been married once. <gasps> I haven't even <gasps> been married once. What's you know, wrong it with feels you, like, Melina? What's it wrong? Feels, 
like a measure of success or a measure of failure, I guess. It shouldn't, um, though, When it should shouldn't. It, it shouldn't exactly. be. It but totally for some shouldn't. reason, societally, yeah. this is what women tell ourselves. You know, not just women, men too, to yeah, a certain extent. But yeah. But a lot of women, a lot of women. And so I think there's this unfair pressure that like you need to have all your shit figured out. And mm-hmm. people feel that about their careers too. By the time they're like 30, they're like, oh my God, why isn't my career in place? You know, or uh, or their finances or or whatever, right? A lot of people feel this in, in many different ways. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I think that all of my relationships, if I could say there was a pattern, is that they weren't the right person for me, mm-hmm. which I kind of knew from the beginning. Right. But instead of, cutting my losses early, I kind of kept it going, um, thinking that, well, maybe I can make it work. And, I, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's really just a level of desperation, I guess. Um, and I, what but, I should have done is cut, cut, is cut them off earlier and, yeah. you know, maybe make space for, for someone who would be better for me. Yeah. But I don't regret any of them. I learned, I learned something in That's each good. one of them. Yeah. That's very good. And they're all, they're all good people. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I could well. totally, <laughs> I can totally say the same thing about the relationships I've been in, and I can very much relate to the to the letting it drag on longer than it should. I believe, or I, you know, I, that's that's just an assumption on my part to make. But I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Let me put it that way: that if many relationships dragged on beyond the point where both people knew it, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't salvageable, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you go at least a. Uh, I don't know, you, you go a decent amount of time, right? Like in my case, with the relationships that I ended, uh, or that ended, <laughs> mm-hmm. oftentimes I'm, I'm, I'm chicken shit. I'm just, I'm just waiting for the girl <laughs> to end the relationship. Which is, oh, why? I know, I know. That's one, one really bad thing about me. I ended one relationship Oy. in my life. Okay. And the other ones. But then again, I, I mean, yeah. But at that point, it's, it's always clear already, you know, like both parties know okay this isn't this isn't going anywhere no and you kind of just have to just have to understand that that's what's happening Mm -hmm. um but i've always it's always been very important to me that to to separate the the hurt and the tragedy that comes with that you know from the person because they're not you know they're not bad people at least the the people that i've been with um i Mm -hmm. you know they're they're good people and I, I, yeah. I do wish them the best. You know, I have no, I have no ill yeah. feelings. You know, of course it sucks for both sides, and I try to see that. You know, when when a relationship has to end. I mean, I've been, I'm in the lucky mm-hmm. position that, at least as far as I know, I haven't been cheated on. I haven't been, my trust hasn't been violated in any severe manner, and I haven't mm-hmm. done that mm-hmm. to to a girl either. You know, so that's, I'm, I'm sure that makes it worse yeah, if that good. happens. You know, that, that <laughs> probably is pretty bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I can say that for me, I've gone, I've gotten better. Yeah. So like I was talking about decluttering, mm-hmm. decluttering my digital life, decluttering my, um, your Facebook, my, you and everything. That. Yeah. And my Facebook. Yes. I've been, I've been, I've been removing friends from my Facebook cause they weren't that real friends and I've just it. been, it, I've been, <laughs> I've been purging, I've been purging, right. but anyway, um, I've gotten, I've gotten overall better at letting people go mm-hmm. when they are, when I realize that it's not a good fit Mm -hmm. and I even speak that about um so my last you know I get better at breakups (laughs) that's the thing I get better at breakups we all do Um, but even even friends even friends like there are some people you know who over the years you know something sometimes you're friends with people just because of history Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day you don't have much in common with them and you don't even see things eye to eye and really it's it's actually not even you know it's actually draining sometimes energy draining to, to, to remain friends with, with certain people. Right. Um, and in the last few years, ever since I've really changed my life, I think, and when I say change my life, it's my, my career life and, and just the way I live my life and everything, um, which we can talk about later. But ever since I did that change, I think kind of things have slowly fallen into place. I've gotten rid or decluttered, <laughs> um, the friendships that no longer, uh, lifted me up. Yeah. No longer were had a good purpose to them. No longer felt good, um, and and also and also boyfriends. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and really started living in a cheesy way. You can, this is very uh, cheesy, but in a more authentic life. Mm-hmm. But it's true. I think like I start. I finally started realizing. Okay, who am I really? What do I really need and want from people? What do I and and what do I appreciate in people? And what 
is best for me. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But it's a process and you have to get used to letting go. You know? And the problem too is that if you let go of too many people, then suddenly you find yourself all alone. You got none of them so the left. other so the, the other thing you have to do you when you find let go of people ground. is you gotta is you gotta make you gotta be willing to make new connections. Yes. And this is a problem I find with today's world. I don't know how it is in Germany, but I feel like here in North America or in Montreal specifically, and Montreal is probably one of the better ones, but uh, I find that people don't go out of their way to meet new people so much. Yeah, I find I know, that I as well. I don't know how you felt when I, you were in Montreal. Like, did you feel that way or were, did you have a good in, group of people? In Montreal, I mean, I found it easy once I found, I discovered Mundolingo. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, what, what we're talking about now, just to clarify, I guess, because I don't think anybody misunderstands, but um, we're not, we're talking about, we're, we're pretending it's 2019. It's not, we're not talking about COVID times because obviously now everything's different. But let's everything's say, messed up even more now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. but let's say under normal or what used to be normal circumstances, um, mm-hmm. I did find it difficult to meet people. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also, I think it requires a lot of patience, no matter where you are. Um, certain countries you're more likely or, or people are more quick to open up to you. Um, in the States, I find that's certainly the case. I, I would say probably in Canada as well. I mean, Canadians are known around the world for being extremely open, extremely friendly. Um, yeah. So I, I, I certainly found it possible to put myself out there and in return mm-hmm. meet people and, and make French, friends. But really close, good friendships, people that I that I feel really close to. There's Lucas, mm-hmm. who I think you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's also a, a future guest at some point. <laughs> uh, nice. And he's he's definitely one of my closest friends in life. Like I consider him a, a friend for life. Like he's in the, in the closest circle for me. Um, and right. I met him through Mundolingo. Uh, right. Which I'm gonna just quickly explain what that is or was. Unfortunately, Mundolingo was a an organization that had that existed in many cities around the world. I think by the end it was 30, 20 something or close to 30 cities around mm-hmm. the world, Buenos Aires, um, Chiang Mai, Barcelona, like everywhere. And Great. in Montreal, there were three Mundolingos. And what they were is you, Mundolingo would cooperate with local bars and, and clubs or uh, like taverns and stuff. And every, let's say Tuesday of the week, there would be Mundolingo at uh, what was the name of the bar? I don't remember. Anyway, a bar in Montreal, Mont- 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 yeah. um, mm-hmm. or Saint Denis, and you you could go there. And at the entrance, there would be a table. They would give you flags that you stick, like s- s- adhesive flags that you stick to your lapel, and you could say, "Okay, I speak Canadian English, German, and French in that order, and mm-hmm. I want to speak to people who speak the same language." And all you, like the target audience was between twenty and thirty-five years old, usually. But you did have mm-hmm. older people there as well. There were people who were like 60 something and they came all the time. And all you do is you walk in and you just, the, the point of Mundolingo is to talk to people and meet people. Yeah. So obviously that That's made it great. extremely easy. Right? And yeah. me being, um, I had the added bonus of being the photographer for Mundolingo. So first right. of all, that uh, me um, professionally, that, that gave me an incredible boost because imagine being in a dimly lit bar Mm-hmm. With a fairly good camera. I have a Canon EOS 6D, so it's a good camera. Um, but having to shoot photos uh, without flash, mm-hmm. like I don't want to, you know, shoot a flash in people's face. Right. So you have a yeah. dimly lit bar at night. It's dark outside. It's dimly lit inside. And you need to get yeah. sharp pictures. So once right. you've mastered that, you're, you're pretty good. Yeah, that, that took time. <laughs> yeah. But eventually I got really good at it. And I, I, I huh. became... I ended up becoming the international photography manager for Mundolingo. So I managed the photography what? for all cities across the world. Like I would, I didn't I would, know that. Yeah, yeah, That's that was amazing. it was so cool. I was so like Benji, who runs it, like the the head head of Mundolingo. Mm-hmm. Um, he contacted me. Is this Benji Shearer by any chance? No, Morera is his name. Oh. Oh, okay. Never yes. mind. Somebody else. He's he's in uh, he's from Great Britain, and right now he oh, lives in okay, Thailand. Oh, definitely not. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, but. So yeah, he at one point contacted me and he was like, um, "Do you did you know that people use your photos as reference around the world in all the cities?" And I was like, "Wait a minute, what?" Yeah. <laughs> no fucking way! Uh, I yeah. was really honored and uh, to to be right. that to be a Mundolingo 
Uh, the, yeah. The, yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's how I met Luca. So, you know, if you find something, but this is rare, something like Mundolingo is rare. And obviously now it's burned to the ground. It, and there's, this, there's no telling if it's going to come back. Like once this crisis is over, Mundolingo might be gone. It might not happen. Yeah. Again. But oh, while it existed, gosh. it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the Cologne, Mundolingo Cologne, they had 200 people in, in that bar every Wednesday night. It was wow. incredible. Like you could go in there and uh, just meet people. You know, it would be crazy yeah. packed. Like I, I didn't like going in the winter because I'm okay. Uh, I'm an introvert. I, you know, I, I'm an extrovert <laughs> by, pra by practice, but an introvert by nature. And huge okay. crowds, um, I feel extremely uncomfortable and I shut down. I, I become okay. like, I, I put this armor around me. And okay, oftentimes okay. I just hide behind my camera and I'm like, I'm glad I'm the photographer. I don't need, right. to, go. I don't need to interact with this, with this right, crowd that's attacking right, me. Right, right. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. So it was a fantastic way to meet people. But outside of that, um, you meet people through work, right? But that's pretty quickly. Like if you want to date, then, you know, uh, there's that saying. Don't, <laughs> it's not a good idea to date the uh, yeah, workers. <laughs> don't, don't fuck with the paycheck, right? right? Um, yeah. So good, not a good idea. And um Friends. You I think that once I had, friends, a fling, but... I had a fling with somebody at work, but that was it. Uh, and mm -hmm. it stayed uh, undercover, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, not a good idea, right? Although Babel, of course, is, was full of young and attractive people, but you know, you don't want to go there. Yeah, um, you don't want to mess that up. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hear and, you. And now, you know, especially, you know, if you work for yourself and you work, let's say, from home. Yeah. What like are you going to do to most people, people are doing right now? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm I'm a piano teacher, so uh, I don't work with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I have my online lessons during COVID, mm -hmm. and also, you know, on, on a normal year, I have students that come to my house. This is this is my work, right? Yeah. So um, I don't meet anybody through work. Uh, the only other type of work I do have is my performances, mm -hmm. um, which is great. But that's another place where I don't meet people. Too much. I meet people on a very superficial level, but most of the time people, you know, they're coming to a show because I'm, I'm performing in a restaurant or something like that. I mean, they're not there to meet me. They're there to watch me or not even, they're not even there to watch me. They're there to have their dinner Yeah. <laughs> and I just happen to be there. Um, so, I mean, I'm not really meeting people who are interested in meeting people at that moment anyway. Yes, yes. Um, and there's also this weird, this weird uh, feeling sometimes where, you know, I'm the artist on the stage and they're the audience. And sometimes people don't actually even want to meet me because they're so, they're kind of like looking at it as like, almost like through a glass. It's all, you know, like there's a bit of a distance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even though like I'm just a normal person who just happens to be playing and pia piano and singing, but sometimes people are a little bit like, I'm not sure what the word is, but uh, scared or they don't want to like connect. Yeah, I know. I don't know. So yeah, I get that. I find it pretty tricky to, to, to meet new people. Um, the best times I had for meeting people was when I had gone back to school. So I went back to, and did an MBA like in, Absolutely. in my, when I was 28, um, after I'd been in industry <laughs> working for, for a number of years, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to school and get a, get a business degree right. and this and that. Yeah. So I did. And, and that was a great time for me to, to, to be other. And I'm the opposite of you. I'm actually quite extroverted. I, I would, I think exactly. like, I love meeting people. I love going up to people. I have no problem going up to people and striking up conversations, but if they don't respond back to me, then I'm like, okay, I'm going to move away now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's worth the try, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, I used to get a little bit, I used to be shy as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I think I just kind of grew out of that eventually. Yeah, I had to grow and out of I'm it. And I'm shy certainly. in there's certain circumstances. Yeah. But I think it's, it's I get, there's more benefit to, to being open and being extroverted and forcing yourself to, you know, to, to, to go up to people and, and just be a little bit more, um, like not to be afraid, you know, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. fear of rejection that we all feel a little that, bit. That totally that's is. That's what it yeah. is at the end of the day. <laughs> and that's, it's funny, like you're leading into a subject that I wanted to talk about next, um, very mm -hmm. much related to meeting people. But um, I wanted to just quickly go into your experience of gender roles but in, in between mm. or in meeting people, because let's talk about that. <laughs> I, I still think there's certain, right. There's, there's certain um, ex, uh, expectations that are 
there for men versus women who's supposed to do what and not do what when meeting right or to, when going up to meet mm -hmm. but before we do that mm -hmm. um let's let's start with um city of love the 2009 okay. album yeah so just a refresher uh we have six tr tracks on here um x-ray yeah. eyes city of love place in my heart fireflies new phase the mm -hmm. first version and threadbare right <laughs> And yeah. you, you packaged it actually with the DVD on the second, uh, as a second disc, yeah. which had a music video yeah. for X-Ray Eyes. Yeah. Um, which song would you want to pick out of those? Which one would you like to showcase? So, okay, I'll tell you what I think is, is, could be like a crowd favorite. And I'll tell you what my personal favorite is. Gotcha. I think what a crowd favorite would be is probably um, well, either X-Ray Eyes because it had a really cute video, mm -hmm. or City of Love Which because is on it's YouTube. very Montreal centered. Yeah, yeah, both of those are on YouTube. City, City of Love of has the... also a music video as well. Okay, yeah. Um, and so both City of Love, I actually really like City of Love. It's 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 about Montreal. It's about being yeah. a city of what I consider it love. Yes. Um, so I would say those two are probably the crowd favorites, but I. I'm more, uh, I guess I'm more connected to the song called Threadbare um, because it was another sort of sad tune <laughs> Okay. That, that, uh, that I was very, uh, uh, yeah, connected to. But I'm not sure which one you'd rather. Well, out of those three, which one do you prefer? I was going to say City of Love um, because when I listened okay. to it today, um, yeah. I noticed that it has a guitar solo. <laughs> yes, it and does. I was so happy. Like um, I, I'm, I'm really happy whenever there's a song that's this modern, right? And I mean, yes, now it's yeah. 11 years old, but still, you know, in modern times, um, it's, it's not from the 80s, and it, it has this guitar solo. And also, <laughs> it's a song that really, yeah. like you say, it's about Montreal. So it, it's about a place. Yeah. It's about a feeling that you sure. get from that place, and uh, it, sure. it expresses that. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? Or, like, let's let's say we do that song. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know, it depends if you're going to show the video, but uh, I do encourage people I was gonna, to. I was going to no, play the song. I encourage people you know, to listen actually... to the song first and then later go see the video. Okay. Because... Unless you want to show the video now. But anyway. No, certainly not. I would I would definitely, I would direct the It's going to be in the description for anybody okay. being, anybody Perfect. curious about it. Um, go check out the yeah. video. Uh, but that being said, the, those two songs are on YouTube. Why don't we play? Why don't we play uh, Place in My Heart? Let's do Place in My Heart because that's not that's, on YouTube. That's, that's, that's one, not so easy to get. That one or I was, I was saying Threadbare. I was uh, saying Threadbare. Threadbare. My bad, my bad. Threadbare. I'm sorry. <laughs> Place in My Heart's a nice one too. Let's play Threadbare. Um, All right. Anything else you want cool. to say about it? About Threadbare? Yeah. Okay. So Threadbare. Actually, that one's a pretty um, metaphorical tune. So that one is about how we live in a particular universe mm -hmm. okay our own universe your life is your universe okay and how it's possible that there are that there might be on the other side of this like very thin membrane possibly another universe that we are sort of glimpsing into a little bit from time to time and so threadbare is like talking about how the membrane that separates our universes might be kind of slightly unraveling and maybe we're getting glimpses into these other universes. Shit. Yeah, I didn't even pretty... realize that what it was that's what it was about. I, yeah. I don't even know if I could listen to the lyrics that closely in the past. Interesting, very interesting. I didn't know. <laughs> okay, let's let's find out what that sounds like. All right. Enjoy. Cool. Watched him turn away from life 
back okay um hey long time no see hey <laughs> long time um so we were talking about um dating and relationships and we were at a point where we were talking about meeting people and i've always found it interesting and I, i've been meaning to ask you that um something mm -hmm. i might bring up with later guests as well just to see how different people perceive this. Um, but there's still, even in today's world where gender roles are getting um, liquefied in a way, <laughs> uh, they're getting <laughs> softer, right? Like they're, they're not as strict as yes. they used to be like decades ago. Um, yes. But I think by and large, men are still expected to make the first move to, uh, to, to approach the woman to um to make the first moves in the relate to, to take the uh the relationship to whatever next step is supposed to happen or they want to happen mm -hmm. um i mm -hmm. believe that's also a thing that we, just as humans um it makes a person attractive right and it, I, I guess traditionally it certainly makes a man attractive to be decisive to be confident to make the decisions to make the call um but that also of course brings certain pressures with it for us as men and it brings certain pressures and roles with it for you guys as women um and i'm wondering if you just personally not not you as a member of uh of uh the female sex but just you manina uh species, if you ever, female species. <laughs> species the female species is a different species <laughs> I, I never understood um but uh if if you ever felt like breaking that or feel, first of all, do you feel like this is still a thing? Um, mm -hmm. And do you feel like breaking that? Like, do you go out and just you find somebody attractive and you just walk up to them and you meet them? This is a very interesting topic. Um, and, you know, I've always actually told my friends that, like, you know what? I, if I was a man, I'd be the best frigging man out there. <laughs> because I feel, you know, a little bit manly in that respect in right. terms of like assertiveness and confidence and decisiveness and leading mm -hmm. the way. And yet, yeah, there is there are still these these sort of understood gender roles. Um, and it's an interesting it's an interesting uh I guess, situation, because so uh, 
I experimented actually at one point. I was like, you know what? I'm tired of waiting for guys to make the first move and like come talk to me. Like, screw that. I'm gonna go and like approach somebody myself. Yeah. And I did. And actually, one of my boyfriends, one of my exes, turned turned into a boyfriend because I went. I did the first move. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it did work out. But 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 then we broke up. But anyway. Um, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but part of me is like. And I'm a little bit I'm a little bit like torn on this idea because I do think that women should be allowed to go and go up to a guy or go up, you know, and make the first move. But I think it's a little bit of dangerous territory, too, because for the most part, guys are automatically going to be like, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's almost like. Um, and this is probably because, I mean, a lot of guys are shy these days. I don't know if it's like worse now than in the past, but I feel like a lot of men don't make the first move. Yeah. When they should. Um, Absolutely. And they should, but they've never really been sort of taught how to do it. Um, so there is, there's a lot of men who don't make the first move, Mm -hmm. um, or they're too shy to do it. And so, but then it's a little bit tricky because if women do it, sometimes the guy's just going to say yes, because just because it's so like out of the blue and they're like, uh, okay. But they didn't, they never really were that interested or something. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it kind of, it kind of creates this weird expectation of like, okay, well now, uh, it's almost like the guy was like, he's kind of like waiting for things to just kind of happen. And like he, then he never sort of learned to t- to make any moves and he just never picks up the slack. And it ends up being a weird relationship if that does go on, you know, because then the woman is like the woman is kind of like constantly, <laughs> I guess, leading because the way. Because once you once you once you go down that road, you stay on that road, right? You, you stay the decision well, maker of. in the relationship. Yeah, that's something it I had to learn. That way. Yeah, that's something that that I think um, men do need to learn. Um, because for all the uh, for for. Like there's there's movements out there, right? That that say, okay, sisters are doing it for themselves. You know, women, it's women time now, and uh, 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 men should should not be this and should not be that and should not behave that way and should not be pigs. And but then you know, it, it has the effect on men that they're like, oh God, I'm not I'm not supposed to talk to a woman because you know, there's literally I've read articles uh, by women um, in, in like uh, um, on blogs or like and. An, Mm-hmm. Uh, online magazines where they're like, if mm-hmm. I'm in the if I'm in the subway, just don't talk to me. Just don't. I don't want to be talked to, you know. And yeah. that's the message they're sending out. Just stop talking to me. And you know, men hear that message. They're like, okay, women don't want to be talked to. Like they don't want that, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And that there's like a lot of these women are very loud. And then on the other hand, women are like, wait, why isn't that guy talking to me? He's cute. What's 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 stopping him? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's gone. It's kind of well, backfired. Like it's backfired. I mean, there are certain, yeah, because the, there the are certain situations are good. where, of course, we don't want to be harassed. We don't want exactly. men to harass with you know yeah. us, but but we also don't want them to be like too mousy and like not even try. And that's what I, <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I was getting at before I viewed off track a little bit just know? there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you know, I think as a guy, or I think as a person, it's just an attractive trait. If you mm-hmm. have um, the confidence and the assertiveness to just go and do things, like my girlfriend says that about me. Like when I make a decision, she's like, "That was just very attractive what you just did," you know. And I'm like, "This is what's gonna happen." Like sometimes I'm like, "This is what's gonna happen next. We're gonna have dinner and we're gonna watch this on Netflix." <laughs> That's literally yeah. all I say. No, no, no. This is how this evening is gonna go. And she's like, "Fuck yeah, I'm in." And uh, you know, this is attractive. She it's likes very that, attractive you know? when a man can choose the Netflix movie. You know. <laughs> Exactly. That's all you need to do. I mean, don't literally. I mean, you on. don't like, have just, to. Just make a decision, goddammit. You don't have to scale a skyscraper. I mean, just you know. Um, Absolutely. And that, that 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 doesn't denigrate the woman. That doesn't put her down. You know, my my girlfriend is a very like I would categorize her as a, as a very strong woman. You know, she has her own will. She's not taking any bullshit. Uh, but you know, she who's wants, more decisive she, between the two of you? Um, that's a good question. She's gonna watch this. She's gonna watch this later, and she's gonna she's gonna say, "You said what?" Uh, no, she's not. She, she won't. Um, but I'm actually not sure. I don't think either of us are more or less decisive. Okay. We both have that. Hmm. We're both able to make decisions, and we will when the situation calls for it. Okay. Um, I, I yeah. think that's that's fairly equal. 
Yeah. Well, you know, so I can, so talking about like guys and their sort of lack of confidence these days. Um, <laughs> these days. Uh, I don't know if it's a lack of Back confidence, but it's day. definitely a lack of <laughs> yeah. assertiveness. Okay. Yes. Um, I personally am the kind of, cause, because I'm so kind of loud myself. Um, I yeah, do God, like so when a guy is, is persistent and confident. And when a guy goes out of his way to, to ask me on a date, yeah. I, I just like yesterday, I got asked out on a date for the first time in like, I don't know how long. Okay. Like probably at least a year. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, by a guy who just wrote to me a message on Facebook. Um, and he was just, and, and you know what? I'm like, I kind of appreciate that, you know, like yeah. not that I put that I'm single on Facebook. I guess that's probably the, one of the other reasons that mm -hmm. I don't get asked on dates. But um, I don't like I don't like advertising that I'm that yeah. I'm single. But um, but it but it does feel nice. That, like a guy's like, hey, random question, but would you like to go out for coffee sometime? And I was like, well, I'd love to, but we're in a global pandemic and there is no places to go. Yeah. So now it's actually hard. To date. It is, yeah. Now, it's, like, now of course, it's difficult. But hey, I mean, you've got that. You know, you've like, got that. Like, if you if you look at the guy and you think he's he's nice and you want to meet him, um, just wait a few weeks until it's possible. <laughs> and you know, I'm hoping you oh, wrote this, back. This, this, this like, pandemic is not going to end anytime soon. What I told him was like, listen, um, yeah, we okay, can't you told go anywhere. Something. We yeah. can't go for co there's coffee shops are closed, restaurants are closed, movie theaters are closed, everything's freaking closed. So I'm like, well, we can get a coffee to go and walk in the park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you think that's going to happen? Is he gonna... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, okay. uh, you know, but see, I think, you I think this, I mean, this you is know... a weird time for, for dating. Yeah. Pandemic time, weird time for dating. Yeah. But I think, yeah. you know, we can all relate gender, like male or female, we can relate to the, the fear of rejection. And that's a very, very strong motivator. I would say demotivator, right? Uh, that right. stops us from, from pursuing um, right. what we want. You know, and that's yeah. Uh, and the that's thing is, you might not, thing. you don't even know if you want that person, but you're just kind of like, you know, well, yeah, let me like, open the door and exactly. see you're if there's something interesting. You're not giving yourself there. the option to find out, right? You know, you know what I've started doing. So in the last few years, um, if someone does ask me, so a lot of times guys might, and even this this particular message was not super clear that it was a date, right? right. But I mean, obviously, it kind of he intended it as a date. But sometimes people are just like, oh, we should hang out sometime, or. Oh, um, like are you going to this event? Yeah, it'd be cool to, to see you there at this event. And it's like not super clear mm -hmm. that they that they're like eh, maybe asking on a date. And I've actually put guys in like specifically in like the hot seat. I'm like, are you asking me on a date? Question mark. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and they'll be like, uh, yeah, I guess so. You know, or sometimes they're like, oh, uh, no, 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 I, 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 no, I'm just uh, just as a friend. I don't know. But that so, tells like, you something about I the person. When they're clear. I yeah. prefer when it's clear. Yeah. You know? Because, like, okay, so if you ask me on a date, then, like, present it like a date. Say, like, I'd like to take you out on a date. Can we go for coffee sometime? Or can we go off dinner sometime? Mm -hmm. You know? I think guys need to bring that back. I think that's, that's a level of, I don't know if it's chivalry or, or what, but it's, it's something that guys need to bring back, personally, I feel. Yeah. And they'll get a lot more success if they do. Yeah, I think <laughs> I so think. as well. I mean, that's, that's the experience that I've, I've had, you know, and I feel... I needed to learn that, you know, because like throughout my my life, um, like I, it's a very overwhelming impression that I think many guys get, and like not everybody is able to rise above that and and realize that this is just an impression. But the impression that we get is leave women alone; they don't want to be bothered; they don't want to be, you know, just just don't don't annoy them, you know, don't uh, don't try to hit on them. You're going to be an asshole, you know, and you're. It's not even the fear of rejection, but it's just the fear of we're living in a climate where that's not something you're supposed to do. And it's funny because like even for me um, personally, like this is just I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just talking about personal experience here. Right. Like mm -hmm. don't anybody listening to this. Don't try <laughs> Don't don't say I'm trying to speak for other men like this is me. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, so let's let's narrow this down to me. Uh, but that has been like the voice in my head has been telling me that for a long time, you know, and um, so just leave and it that's alone. Wrong. Just don't... You're not going to bother someone exactly. just by asking them out on a date. That's wrong. You'll it's... bother them if you ask them continuously and they keep saying no and you're persistent. Absolutely. Then, or if you, you know, eventually, you know, yeah, you, you do need to learn as a as a man or as a person to uh, as a man, woman to be to to do when you approach a stranger. Uh, yeah. Let's say this is the extreme like this is the extreme situation. I mean, if it's somebody at work, you talk to them a few times and then you ask them out not at work let's say a school 
<laughs> right well you know in, in, in an environment where you already yeah. you have like a, a warm it's a warm approach right but if you're doing a cold yeah. approach as in you don't know that person you cross the street get to them and talk to them right um yeah then and you need a, to also project too. Yeah. you need to project something you need to like if you're being really creepy about it if you wait if you hover if you look you know and the person sees you from the corner of their eye and then you come over and then you're like you stutter about it or something you know yeah uh that's probably not gonna not gonna fly so well you know but if you just go it's over confidence. And you, yeah if you get to a point where you just say it normally at least that has yeah. been my experience you know yeah like for yeah. me what has been like some of the be most beautiful experiences i've had were and montreal allows you to do that montreal is a city where it's possible to do that in 2019 um, probably in 2000, back, <laughs> up until now. 2019 um, I would go out, like I was, I remember there's, there's two occasions. One was I was out with friends at night. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not even a, that much of a nightlife guy. I don't go to clubs, uh, or if I do, I hate it. Um, but we were just <laughs> out in the street and there was a girl and I liked her dress. She was wearing a red dress. So I walked up to her mm -hmm. and I was like the friends I was out with, we were like deliberately also going out and saying like, and saying to ourselves, okay, let's, let's just try to meet somebody. Let's just do that. Yeah. Let's just really, um, right push our comfort zone and, and go yeah. out there and try to do that, you know? Sure. And I was like, I, so I walked up to her and I just took a deep breath, you know, chill, easy, just walk up one foot in front of the other and just say, Hey, you know what? This is a beautiful dress. And you should have yeah. seen that girl. Like she lit up. She was so happy that I said that, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I think what you're doing as a... All women love if, receiving yeah. compliments. Come on. And yeah, I mean, it, it shouldn't be something that, you know, if I said you have nice boobs, then that would well, be the that's... wrong kind of compliment, <laughs> right? Um, it needs to be something that, you know, you where you yeah. can tell, okay, the person did that, you know? Like you you put on makeup and it looks nice, you know? So that's, that's the thing that I could say. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also, I think, what, you know, what, what gives guys that bad reputation is... Um, bad reputation in... in <laughs> quotation marks you know or what makes it difficult for guys yeah. is the is the assholes just just hollering at girls or harassing them or being yeah. like nice ass or something yeah. like that right yeah um then that yeah. obviously uh you know that that pisses off women of course it does um, well yeah that's right yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, you know so i don't think that's the majority of guys like i don't think the majority of guys are assholes <laughs> yeah like i think but it makes it unfortunately, understandable. the assholes are the ones that are the loudest and the most obnoxious. And so Absolutely. unfortunately, they, they give guys a bad name, like yeah. a bad rap. But I think the majority of guys are normal human beings that are actually probably more on the shy side yeah. than on the super outgoing, obnoxious side. Yeah. Um, and those guys, you know, are the ones that need to step up a little bit and learn skills on how to meet people and how to go up to people, especially, you know, women and this and that. And... And just start, just strike up conversation. And that's not something that, I mean, it's not just for women. Like, sometimes people are just too shy to meet anybody in yeah. general. Yeah. You know, and that's, and I think that, like, like we were talking a little bit about earlier, uh, this is possibly a result of, of everyone, you know, keeping their heads down on their smartphones like this all day God long, damn, you know. Yeah. And, that's certainly and not making it better. The technology addiction, you know, or just like this. And we all work from home and we're all, we don't want to meet people. We're a little bit antisocial, a little bit too intro, introverted. Yeah. Um, this is this is all a result of all that, you know. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, certainly and not I helping. think men and women need to get out of their comfort zone. I mean, I I know some people. So, you know, I'm I, I grew up with, okay. And a lot of some of my people, some of the people I'm not going to say they're friends because they're not necessarily my friends, but they're people I know. Um, some people that I that I know from high school never met, barely ever met anybody else outside of high school. Cause they just stuck with their own group of friends yeah. their entire life. And like, yeah. you know, 20 years later, they're still hanging out with the same people. You know, now they have maybe some kids and this and that, but like nobody knew. And I feel like that's, I so never limited. wanted to like, be why that. Why are you oh limiting your yeah. circle of friends to just the people you, you grew up with? Like yeah. there's so many cool, interesting new people that you can meet, you know, and this is what and I was saying. Imagine how they could expand about, your like, horizons, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. When, when I went to Korea, so we're talking about South Korea mm -hmm, again. Mm -hmm. When I went to South Korea, I didn't know anybody. I didn't even speak the language, right? I'm not Korean at all, and I did not speak Korean. And when, the place I went, you would think that everyone in Asia speaks English, but no, no, they do not. No, the, the level of English was quite low in Busan, okay? Uh, so I, was, I felt quite isolated, actually, when I first got there. But 
um, what I did was I looked up these sort of meetup groups and I found one that was kind of similar to Mundo Lingo, except it was, um, it was, it was a meetup group for people who want to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to learn Spanish. So I'm just going to go to Korea and learn Spanish. Is that, <laughs> Why not? is that how you ended up recording the song in Spanish? Uh, which song? Um, I don't think I have a Spanish song. Yes, you do. I mean, I've done, I do sing in Spanish for jazz stuff, but I don't uh, think I have Spanish Besame songs. Besame mucho. That's Spanish, oh, isn't that it? Oh, that one. Well, that was, okay, yeah, but that, that's my jazz tune. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not the reason I recorded it, but okay, yes, gotcha. I do, I do love But it helped that you, that you learn Spanish. Okay. Yeah, but I was just, I was practicing it, right? But it was a great place for me to meet people, um, you know, and, uh, my point was that, like, you have to go out of your way to meet, to, to meet people. Cause it, yes. otherwise you're just going to, if everyone is, is too shy to go up to other people, then, then we never create connections. Yeah. We never create connections. Yeah, you have do. to. And one of the people that I met in South Korea, it was like, oh, this lovely. She was, um, an older, kind of an older lady. She was like in her fifties. Um, and it was this amazing woman who was just so full of life. We became really good friends. Like, she was, um, and I'll tell you her story. She, she had married an American man, um, and had a child and then they got divorced and then she was rediscovering herself as, as a person. And her, actually her son ended up going to live in the U S with, with, uh, his, his father. And so she found herself, you know, kind of restarting life, uh, by herself in South Korea, you know, where, where she grew up. Um, but she spoke English very well because she had spent some time in the U.S. And she was like, you know what? She was already quite um, active. She she used to, she was doing yoga very actively, and she 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 was a, she was a vegan, which was very unusual in South Korea because they don't know very much about veganism mm -hmm. in South Korea. So she was um, kind of going against the grain in many ways. She actually decided to quit her job and open what she called nature school. So she decided to. Uh, it was kind of like an after-school program for kids to discover nature. Nice. And so she would take these kids, like, you know, six years old to about 12, on these nature hikes and talk about the trees and the flowers and the properties of all these herbs and things like that. Like, she just actually knew all this stuff. Nice. Yeah. And she just, um, she was just spent her time teaching kids this. That was her job, uh, which she created for herself. And then... Uh, by the time we became close friends, because we kind of bonded on us both being sort of a bit unusual characters, I suppose, uh, and kind of going against the grain in, in certain respects. And um, and by the time I left Korea, the next thing I heard, like a few months later, is she had decided to leave Korea, join a group of sailors, and live on a sailboat for a year and go around the world. And that's literally what she did. That is so she awesome. She ended up coming back to Korea and she wrote a whole blog about it, about her experience living on a boat yeah. for a year. <laughs> like, That's just awesome, amazing. Right? That's just really great. Yeah. So the, the people you'll meet if you just open yourself up to it is amazing, you know. But if you don't open yourself up to it, then, you know, the cost of, of remaining too much in your shell, it's really high. It's really high. I think so, yeah. You're missing out on a lot of experience that you could have in life. And I believe that, you know, the people we meet um, is, is just like that. That's what makes your life ultimately what your life is going to be. Because everything you, that you do in life, believe it or not, you're gonna, it's, it's going to, you know, the way you treat other people is going to determine your life. You know, yeah. like it's it's really it is the golden rule you get what you give. You know, like or you treat it the way you want to, like uh, whatever the golden rule is. It's what you get what you give. <laughs> you know, like treat people the way you want to you want to be treated. But yeah. um, I, I think what I'm what I'm trying to say is like what you put what you put out there. You know, that's going to come back to you. And if if you're a person that other people genuinely like, like not a dancing clown. You know, not like somebody right. that tries to make people manipulate people into liking them because no. people aren't stupid. You know, you're going to be transparent. But, no. uh, you know, just genuinely be a good person that genuinely cares, yes. genuinely auth yes. like authentically wants to know more about yes. another person, ask more questions yes. than they talk about themselves. Yes. Um, you're going to you're going to be you're going to do so well, I, I think. Or I, I know, you know, like it's, it's mm -hmm. worked for me. Um, and, uh, you're, you're going to have such amazing experiences, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. actually I'm going to tell you one story yeah. that comes to mind when we, when we speak about that, like what you put out there and how you approach other people. 
so when I was doing my studies, um, there was an exam that you needed to do about halfway through the studies. I guess you call it undergraduate or something in, in uh, Canada. Or, it was like well, the middle, middle yeah, of your studies. First level of university. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah first level. And so I needed to go to a, a, an office and meet like a lady there who um, was going to sign me up for that. Right. I needed okay. to bring her my papers. She needed to control them and be like, okay, you qualify. Here's your, here's your thing. And um, so I went there and like, um, other students already told me, okay, this lady is a dragon. You're going to hate being there. She's, she sucks. She's, she's angry. She's nasty. She's, she's going to be really unfriendly to you. Okay. So what I did, I was like, okay, listen, I'm, I, I told myself, I'm going to go in and I'm going to prove them fucking wrong. And I did <laughs> because I opened the door. I walked up to the desk and I was like, so her name was uh, Frau Köhler. Okay. So I said, hello, Frau Köhler. I had a big smile on my face. Like, you know me, you know, like when I approach somebody, I'm like, hello, how are you doing? And I, I yeah. extended my hand and I shook her hand. And that was such a friendly conversation. She was so friendly. Like we, we had Ooh. small talk for like five minutes. She to told me about like what she's been up to. I asked her how she was doing. I was like, I was like how are you? You know, and in yeah. German, in Canada, that's not too unusual to ask somebody, how are you doing? Um, in yes. Germany, it's unheard of. Okay. Wow. So I did that. And she literally, she told me how she was doing. She told me about her daughter who was going to go off to the States and how she felt about wow. that. You know, it's the kid. She's going to go to the States and she doesn't know, like, is that going to be, you know, what does that mean? You know, and like, it's a big step for her as a mother as well. And, um, we had this really pleasant conversation, you know, and like then we conducted our yeah. business in the most pleasant of ways, literally wow. not, a, not a whiff of, of negativity or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when I left, she was like, listen, I just want to say um, nobody comes in here and acts like you did. Everybody who comes in here, the first words out of their mouth are I want. And they have this have like just a, just a, a, right. a face like three, like, like just rainy weather yeah. all the time, you know, like a really serious face and just say, First thing they say is, I want. Thanks for having such yeah. a good conversation with me. Yeah, and, yeah, that's great. I mean, come on. You, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. That's great. All you need to do yeah. is smile and ask how somebody's doing. Yeah. It's just the yeah. best thing ever. And I do that regularly. And I have. Yeah, that's even great. People are you like, probably turn around her day. You probably turn her day uh, yeah, around totally, like that, with totally. that conversation. And I'm sure she remembers mm -hmm. that as well as I do. You know, that day. I'm, or at least I like to think so. Perhaps I think too much <laughs> of myself. She probably does. But yeah, she, she probably does. She probably does. You know. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. You know, just just do that. Just put that out yeah. there. You know, just if yeah. you leave. Well, nobody it, likes a nobody likes a negative Nancy. Nobody likes a negative Nancy. Yeah, no, totally not. You know? Exactly. And I, I think that if you if you make an effort to um, like let's just say, hey, I wanna I wanna make one person's day a little bit better today. And yeah. Just go and do that. You know. Absolutely. It costs Absolutely. You nothing. It really imagine if enough. every imagine if everyone you come into contact with does that. Yeah. How much what if, how much what if, happier yeah. would you be on a day to day basis? Yeah. The world would be better. It's incrementally <laughs> happy yeah. happier, right? Yeah. And actually this this is an interesting um I actually listened to a podcast mm. at one point uh where they I don't even remember what podcast it was, but it was a very interesting uh topic. They were talking about the, the um the invention of the ATM, right? The automatic—is it called an automatic teller machine? Uh, That's what I, it stands well, for. For, I think. for those who are not non-native speakers, um, an ATM is a machine where you go to on a bank, you put in your, your card, machine. and you get cash. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so, so this podcast was talking about the discovery of the of the ATM, or not the discovery, the invention of the ATM. Invention. Yeah. And and you just how? It. Um... <laughs> it's like a cave. What's this thing? <laughs> Like they had like C4 oh and they blasted the cave open and inside. <laughs> Gives me money. <laughs> um, and how they were saying it was kind of like a, a strange uh, double-edged sword. And it, even though it revolutionized the banking industry and, you know, it made money accessible to people at all times of the day and night, you didn't have to wait for the bank to open, this and that, all these advantages to it. But there was one sort of social disadvantage and kind of got the ball rolling on all the other social disadvantages we now experience is that you're replacing a human interaction with a machine. Mm. And it was this small detail of like, okay, you know, what are the elements that make people happy on a day-to-day -day basis? And what they discovered, they've done, they done some research about this. What they discovered is that 
at the end of the day, it's the small interactions we have with human beings, something as simple as going to the post office or going to the bank or going to the grocery store, or going to the pharmacy, where you have this small interaction, human interaction with the person, the cashier or whatever. And if you make it a pleasant experience like you did with the, with the lady, then that sort of adds to your general happiness. But when you take that away and you replace it with a machine and you're just interacting with this machine for all your basic needs, you're, you're being more and more socially disconnected mm. and how that feeds into the general sense of being disconnected from people. Yeah. So I, I thought it was a very interesting experiment and a very interesting podcast that talked about that. Mm, that is a very interesting observation. And, it's and like today, true. you know, how many things are being replaced by machines? I this mean, is, yeah, I mean, right? this is especially now during this a... pandemic, like even the pharmacy, there's nobody who works in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a security guard who, who makes sure you wash your hands, like with the Purell, you know? <laughs> That's about it. And we have the machines. I'm just randomly yeah. reminded of that XKCD comic uh, that's uh, about uh, like the questions we ask ourselves with each new technology that comes around. I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to take a screenshot of that and put that in here or like link to it. Uh, but it's like, um, hang on. It's really funny because like one of the questions is like, what, isn't it going to alienate us more? And then the answer is we were already in you know? here. <laughs> well, yeah. But, you and, know, but uh, it's still, it's probably going to contribute to it. Um, yeah. But what I was going to say, uh, two things I was going to say. One, one I, uh, I, I lost one already, so I'm going to say the other one. <laughs> um, <laughs> about putting yourself out there. Uh, just just, to, just yeah. to quickly jump back to that um, and putting, like, making that connection, talking to strangers, talking to strangers mm -hmm. or just trying to make somebody's day a little bit better, a little bit brighter, mm -hmm. right? Um, Obviously, um, this doesn't have to work. Like you know, yeah. the, like the Sometimes lady, the lady who was so happy that I turned her day around is like a is like a great success story in that way. You know, right. mm -hmm. um, but of course, I've had a lot of people where I'm like, "How are you?" and they 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 ignore the question or they don't want to answer or or they're like, what, uh, "Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm fine," you know, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, very generic. Yeah. And or generic, you know, but I, I never received a negative response. I never received like a leave me alone or something, you know, yeah. and if, even if yeah. I would, I wouldn't take it personally. I would be like, okay, that doesn't say anything about me. The person doesn't know me, um, you know, they're just, they, having, a they're bad just day. having a shitty day. Yeah. Um, but so I, I wouldn't say like if you want to, there shouldn't be a measure of success when you try to do this. You know, you should be like, I'm going right. to go out there and make somebody's day, day better. Oh, God, they didn't they didn't light up like a Christmas tree. Uh, everything's fucked. I, I fucked up, or you know, there was no right. success. The success is in the doing. Like, is yeah. it your intention to do that? Did you do it? Then, yeah, you've succeeded at you know what yeah. you set out to do because you cannot control how people are going to react towards you. You never can. You know, it's a delusional sure. to think you can. You can you can try what you can try your best to steer mm -hmm. people in a certain direction. You know, but how they react towards you is up to them, not up to you. So what are you yeah. going to do, you know, but you, you should try. Um, that's just yeah. one of my convictions. Um, yeah. But there was another thing I was going to say. I was hoping it was going to come back, but it, it doesn't. It's not. Um, oh, well. <laughs> still, It'll very interesting <laughs> subject. And uh, yeah. we, we got here from talking about uh, dating and just approaching people, uh, trying cold approaches. I think as a man, um, that's something we can just quickly come back to before we transition into another just subject altogether. Uh, and listen to another song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm thinking. Jesus, uh, even there, I don't remember what I was gonna say. Uh, I don't know. As a man dating, going up to people, fear of rejection, overcoming. Um, um, yeah. Communication barriers. I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, Gender there were two roles. stories. There were two stories I was gonna tell you earlier, so I might as well tell that other story. And then we'll see where this conversation flows next. Um, <laughs> okay. So that other story was when I was in a, I was on a bus in Montreal, and there was a girl sitting on the bus. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was a pretty crowded bus, and I was standing, and I was like, just close to her, and um, I thought she had, she was wearing beautiful makeup on her eyes. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say you're wearing beautiful makeup. I literally said to her, your eyes look beautiful, and like out of the blue, mm. you know, just across, like uh, just, just out wow. of nowhere, you know. And that was also like that girl was so happy. And what I what I realized that day was that doing something like that. Um, and yeah. then I said, well, I, I just noticed you put you put on makeup, and it seems like you took great care with it, and it looks very lovely on you. 
and she was so happy and she was like oh my god that's so nice and she talked a little bit about herself and then we had this quick conversation and then i stupid me i didn't ask for a number like my my stop came up and i was like okay bye and then i was like what did what what just happened and i'm oh, sure oh, no. and i'm sure she asked herself the same thing like why did he not ask me for my number what the fuck just happened um but yeah that could have been a slam dunk but anyway, opportunity, possibly. just talking about that you know but the, the yeah. actual thing like that happened um or that you know the interaction that i i, I triggered um, I noticed that you, if you do that, if you just genuinely, you walk up to somebody and you genuinely give them a compliment about something that you actually think is lovely on them, like, you know, yeah. the way they did their hair or whatnot, and, yeah. and you point that out to them just calmly and subjectively, like, uh, like mm -hmm. not uh, objective, I, I guess, calmly, like without, <laughs> without trying to, without making a show of it. Right. Something, you know? Yeah. Just, hey, I noticed that about you and I think it's really lovely. And then yeah. you see how they react because what you're doing is mm. metaphorically you're opening a door you're giving them the yeah. chance to walk in and now right. it's up to them the, the ball is now on their side of the court they can yes. pick it up and throw it back to you or they can be like thanks and then nothing yeah. else and then you're like mm -hmm. have a wonderful day and they will have a wonderful day but you know exactly. if like that girl they respond and they ask you something about yourself she asked me something or other about myself um <laughs> i already forgot what it was like how did you know or why did you say how did you know I was an English speaker? How did you know I was a native English oh. speaker? Because it was in Montreal. And uh, because right. I, I, could, I could tell she was looking for something to ask me because she wanted to keep the conversation going. So that was like, how, why did you approach me in English? And I was like... And that would have been a good sign, by the way. That would have been a... That's your opportunity oh, that was to be like, definitely, hey, she was, I'd love to continue this conversation next time. My stop's coming up. Uh, can, would it be possible for me to get in touch with you? Yeah, yeah, you want to... Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I should have done. I did. Yes. Uh, you know, no, 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 no use... Uh, I should be a dating coach. Trying over spilt milk. <laughs> yeah, you should, you should do that. Go out and just take people into the field. Um, but Listen, this is how it's done. I mean, you know, you said, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to get back to. You said earlier, like, men aren't taught this, right? Um, right. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I answered her question by saying, well, I'm not very good at French, so I, I took a chance. <laughs> well, that's all that. <laughs> exactly. Um, but that you say men, men aren't taught this. And it's true. Like, we don't, we don't learn life, right? That's not something we learn in school. We learn, we learn math. We learn economics. We learn history. We learn... Uh, grammar, whatnot, you know, but, but we don't learn life. We don't learn these kinds of skills. So it's uh, the responsibility of, I guess, the social surroundings to teach that or um, the parents. And uh, they can they can succeed or fail in that. And there's not much really, there's not much control anybody exerts over that, you know. So um, mm -hmm. if you're good or bad at, at, at people, you know, is, is up to you. Ultimately, it's, it's up to you. Or it, it has to be if, right. if nobody else teaches you that, you know. So there are attempts. Yeah. There, there was that seduction community. Remember the game? That thing? Like with all these oh. pickup artists going out and trying to pick up girls? Oh, right. It's like 2005 I mean, to yeah, 10, that, that 11 could be, That could easily fall. That could... And that backfired spectacularly. Easily fall into sleazy territory. Exactly. So you got to be that careful thing, with that kind of thing. That thing burned itself to the ground spectacularly with that TV show that I never watched, <laughs> but I know that it was out there. Um, you know, and the book, oh, the game, I actually yeah. read half of that book and then I was like, these people are fucked up. I'm not going to read. I was so tired and, and sickened by it. I was like, oh, Jesus, you know, but that's its community. <sighs> the intention yeah. was, you know, um, to, to try and teach men to somehow master this, you know, and it was, that's, that right. community was specifically tailored towards men, you know, so. Yeah, we can. I think we both have argued in in this podcast and this episode that um, it's a skill that both genders should, you know, Absolutely. ideally, like it, 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 it will benefit both genders to learn. But the seduction when you try to teach it to men, you know, with sleazy yeah. tactics, right? Like by trying to come up with yeah, convoluted that's systems, not the right way you know. To do it. But certainly, um, good, good teach men to be teach men to be authentic yeah. and confident and self reliant and uh, know what they want <clears throat> and, yeah, and you know mean what they say and things like that. Because I mean, if you're teaching people, if you're teaching men to try, to just kind of uh, be sleazy uh, pickup artists, I know, yeah, uh, and like you know that could maybe like work. But routines. I mean, you're basically this is the part of the problem which makes women not trust men Absolutely. is the guys who do that kind of one hundred percent, yeah. 
So, I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, that's not going to help in the, in the long run. No, but, you know, I think, I think it's, it's women too that need to open up too, to, to guys and not think that every guy is a, is a monster and like, you know, wants to do her harm. Like sometimes women go the opposite direction and they, and, and they, they go they, overboard and they're very and they vocal don't trust about guys that. at all. And they're like super anti, you know, men. Yeah. And I think I've gone through a period of time where I was like that too. Yeah. But, um, you know, like I have, I have a, a, a girlfriend of mine who, you know, she's probably in her late thirties now. And, you know, every once in a while I get together with her and she's, and she's like, you know, I wish I could meet somebody. Isn't that? But she's so scared of meeting a stranger. So she says she wants to meet somebody, but then she doesn't want to do an online dating thing. Mm. She doesn't, and she's too afraid to speak to people. She's a very shy person. So she, so if anybody did come up to her in a, in the street or in, you know, in the yeah. grocery store or something like that and, and tell her a compliment, she would just kind of shy away and be like, uh, thank you. And like, you know, lower her head and, and walk away. Well, that's so, not going to go mean, very far. That's not yeah. going to go very far. Of course, you're going to stay single. Like, you got to be open and receptive and you got to, you know, reciprocate. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And like, um, and men need a little encouragement sometimes too. Like, they might make the first move. Sometimes women can make the first move subtly and just kind of like start up a conversation or just kind of like, you or know, little just tiny flirts, yeah. you know, give a signal and guys, like a smile across but I do the think bar. guys need to like pick up the ball and like go the and extra then, mile yeah. and say like, you know what? I'd love to get together with you outside of this grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Would you be, would you, would you be willing to meet up with me somewhere? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I know it seems hard to say that, but I feel like if you just master that sentence, you'll be fine. <laughs> Someone's bound to say yes. <laughs> Lady, ladies and gentlemen, dating coach yeah. Melina. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna, this, is my, this will be my new, is that, this will be my new uh, income stream. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, that, now that there's no live shows anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the next thing. You know what? This oh, podcast boy. is going to catapult you to dating coach fame. Maybe. That's your next thing. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, you've got the video, video cast, uh, broadcasting all set up already. Right. That's um, it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's. So, um, yeah, did, did we want to talk about any other topics? Because um, I do have to eat lunch at some point. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, same here. <laughs> I, I, I got to eat dinner. Uh, later it's, today. Um, so. Yeah, we, we, we don't have... I Not mean, that I want to wrap this up just quickly, but... Yeah, fine. Just say it. Fine. <laughs> no. Um, say what? I'm just, I'm just pulling your leg. <laughs> uh, no, I get it. Um, and it's totally the same here. I mean, it's... No, did you want to talk about, like, Little Molina? Or, or... I think we have a little bit Is more it... time left. And we have two songs yeah. left. Um, so... Bit. What we're going to do is yeah. we're going to go to the album Hold On. Um, okay. We're going to do another song. And then we're going to do another okay. topic. We're not going to go t too much in depth okay. about that, but I want to touch on it. And yeah, it would be like so, sure. like going a little bit back into your life. And then we wrap it up with another Let's song at the end. Um, so That's Hold On, released in 2011, yes. um, has the songs Bang Bang, yeah. Hold On, The Blu-ray Blues, which I thought was really original and I like that. Uh, Love's Got Me Living, hey. It's already obsolete now, Blu-ray Blues. I know, yeah, it's obsolete. It should be the Netflix <laughs> Blues, but then it's probably another... <laughs> you should do the Netflix Blues next, but then it could be a raunchy song. I know, right? Um, the Mama song, Over and Out, which I used for my trailer, for my channel trailer, um, for a while. Uh, new oh, Phase cool. again, Royal Flush, and Hold On, an yeah. acoustic version. I'm, I could name a favorite of mine, but... I'm gonna ask What's you. What's your favorite? Really? Should I? No, I'm gonna ask you first. Okay. Yeah. Um, one that really stands out to me is the Mama song. It's just so cute. Okay. It's really cute. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. But also, what really gets, um, what I, I I like the. Um, and that one has a music video too, the Mama song. For those of <coughs> it you does, who want yeah, to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> so probably we shouldn't play that. People should yeah. go see, yeah. check the, out the video. Um, yes. New Phase is certainly a good song, and I like both versions, but I think I like this one more. Um, okay. And another one, I think the Blu-ray Blues is such an original song that we, we could, this is certainly a contender here. Um, mm -hmm. And Love's Got Me Living. Those those ones are, oh, Love's yeah. Got Me Living, Living has a really good like tempo and, and beat, and uh, it, it, it's, it's got a hook. It hooks you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what my favorites are on that album. Yep. Um, well, I actually do like Hold On. I think okay. that Hold On, even, there's two versions on that album, too, of Hold On. Yes, there is, um, yeah. I, I find that that song has sort of a timeless feel. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like bluesy or maybe I'll, I don't know, someone, someone described it to me almost as country, mm. but maybe it has a little bit of country influence. I don't know. I think um, I like that tune a lot. 
uh, also for what it means. But I also really like uh, Royal Flush. I don't know if that was one of the ones that, that stood out to you, but I found that Royal Flush, it kind of grows on you because it I has like, like a really drums. hypnotic a, beat. Yeah, that hypnotic beat, like the drums that they yeah, really roll over that's you. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, anyway. And I also like hay because hay is really fun too. It's kind of like got this reggae feel. So technically, we like all of them. <laughs> well, it's like got a reggae gypsy feel, like almost. It does. You know, it's yeah. weird. It does. It's a reggae and gypsy like fusion. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, yeah. Do we have any overlap there? Let's let's go with with, with one song that you, that you like a lot. I don't know. Let's go. go with, uh... I I was gonna say let's go with something that that's got uh, a hook and a lot of upbeat. Okay. Because the sure. next album is going to be the jazz album, so it's going to be mellow again, right? Mellow. Um, yeah, true. Let's do Love's Got Me Living. Is that cool? All right. All right. Love's Got Any, Me Living. Anything else you want to say about that one? So that one's just, like you said, it's a very uplifting song. Um, that one is really just about, it's about actually finding love, finally, and and how that has now allowed me to like live life to its fullest. Okay. Yeah, so it, which was it, it accurate does, at the time. <laughs> it does what it says on the tin. <laughs> Good. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right, let's listen to that one. And we'll be back Enjoy. in a few minutes. Hold on. Okay, um, 
last part of the podcast, we are going to... Welcome back, to... everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for still being around. <laughs> Thanks for if still you made it, If you made it this far, if you made it this far, you deserve a medal. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've won as many cars as you can carry. Um, so let's, let's go into, um, history, I guess. Um, it's funny because like, I haven't, um, we, we haven't gone over any of the, like, I have questions prepared for these podcasts that I want to ask my, my, uh, guests in case there's ever a lull, you know, and that, that hasn't happened. <laughs> um, Nope, no lulls here. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm gonna go with with one or two of them at the end as a quick fire questions. Um, but now, I, like, sure. I want to see <clears throat> one thing I do want to go back to with my cli uh, clients, <laughs> with my guests is um, I'm not paying for this. No. <laughs> who were there? Yeah, exactly. Who were there during their formative years, as in their adolescence, their school years? Um, because that mm -hmm. you know a lot of what happens in that time in your life shapes who you're going to become as a person. It certainly did for me. Um, so mm -hmm. I like to think it's the same for other people as well. And I wonder if mm -hmm. during that time, let's say roughly the second decade of your life between 10 and 20 years old, um, can you think of certain occasions or can you think of certain life lessons that you learned that shaped you? It could be through an encounter with somebody, something somebody said about you that made you realize something about yourself. Or it could be just mm -hmm. a creeping realization that, you know, oh, wait, I'm good at making friends or I'm... Uh, something that you realize you're actually not good at, you know. Um, what what are some takeaways for you personally from that area of your life? So that's an interesting question. Uh, and you know what? Believe it or not, I was super shy mm -hmm. as a child and still struggling and, and with by shyness. As a teenager. Yeah, yeah, still struggling with shyness. I was, I felt awkward. I had, you know, braces on my teeth and glasses. And I felt like super, um, and I was like, you know, super nerdy and stuff like that. So believe when, it or not, when, I don't think I, I came into my own until a lot later, you know? Right, yeah. When you said... Um, when yeah. you say nerdy, um, does that mean you read a lot of books? You played video games? You you? Well, I wasn't a video gamer. I wasn't a, I wasn't a gamer, but um, but yeah, I was very studious. Gotcha. So that's one thing. I was very studious uh, in school. I you know I kind of did the typical you know Chinese and Eastern European um, <laughs> tradition of like being a piano player and right. doing very well in math and doing very good you know piano and and uh, and karate and like all these things that were sort of like kind of typical yeah. which just um, uh, just a piece of trivia you mentioned that in the podcast that wasn't to be last week um you started learning piano when you were four so yeah, hats off I started to your learning parents piano when i was four or five yeah, yeah thankfully actually because now this is my life right? yeah exactly um so okay um yeah you were nerdy uh, did you find it difficult i mean obviously you were shy so it probably was difficult to make lots of connections right yeah i mean i ended up having a bit of a you know, a click at school and in my high school. But I remember many days being like, being like, okay, it's lunchtime now. Who do I sit with today? Right. You know, and feeling like awkward and like feeling like, oh, what if these people don't want to eat with me today? And, you know, it took me a while to find my tribe. Um, eventually I did. I think by the time I got to about grade 10, when I was like 16, 17, that's when I finally like found like my group of friends. But I so think that's like five years. leading up to that, I, yeah, I think leading up to that, I was like nervous and shy and, um, you know, had a few like good friends, but didn't have like a click to myself. You know what I mean? And I always felt a little bit like on the outside of things. Was there a turning um, point or did well, it just happen at some point? Did you change? I gained, I gained confidence somehow somewhere along the way um i'm not sure what it, I'm, it wasn't really a, something that happened but i guess maybe by the time well and it's so funny because i had this um i had this this thing that i was doing and i and i still do to this day i keep an agenda a written agenda oh you brought of it what i got <laughs> of what i gotta do every day. Okay. And I still do this to this day, yeah. but this started when I was, when I was a kid and I have all my school agendas from the age of like probably eight or nine 
up until now. <laughs> and, uh, and what I would do is I would, when I was a teenager, I would change the cover of my book. I would put like, put this collage of like, uh, cutouts from magazines and things like that, whatever de- sort of, I felt defined me at that time. So it's so funny because it, each of those agendas are, is kind of like a snapshot of who I was at that moment. Mm-hmm. And so you see me in grade seven, right? Like, uh, 12 years old or so being like the super happy go lucky, super colorful, you know, uh, unicorns and, uh, you know, fun, fun loving things, you know, on my agenda. Then you see my grade eight book starting to be like a little bit more like drastic, like, you know, like skulls and, you know, crossbows and things like that. And I started became getting like a little bit angsty. Yeah. <laughs> my grade nine was like the most angsty that I was. Just severed and heads. then <laughs> Yeah. And then, and then grade 10 started going a little bit back towards like colorful things, but I got into this whole like raver feel, you know, I started liking like all this electronic music and things like that for a period of time. I went through like the grunge right before that was grunge. Um, and, and so you just see this evolution from year to year of who I was and what I was listening to, like the music that I was like to do was defining me at the time. Um, and, and just the things I was interested in, and whatnot, even though my activities, I guess, remained the same, but I just was, I was evolving as a person, mm. you know? Mm. So I don't know if there was really a, a, something, a defining moment that something that happened, but I think I just evolved into, into something. Mm. <laughs> I evolved <laughs> finally by the time I was 16 or 17, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so by, I see. So it's it's just something you you just yeah you evolved. I mean, not through experience, I, I had, but uh, I guess through insight, like through through just understanding certain things that are well good and necessary. I did have I did have a very uh, a, I did have one moment that was quite defining, and um, I don't talk about it very much, but I guess I'll talk about it here on this podcast for everyone to hear. Um, <laughs> it's, so up to, I, it's always up to you, Melina. Like you're... That's okay. No, it's okay. Cool. Uh, I had my first boyfriend when I was uh, 17, mm-hmm. okay? No, was it 17? No, maybe I was like 15, actually, or 16. I don't remember. Anyways, quite Potato, young. potato. But, um, and uh, I was dating this this guy for, for, a little, for a period of time, for like a year, two weeks like two years, I mm. guess. And the thing is, um, what happened was by when I was 17, almost 18, he, he was actually, he was diabetic. He was diabetic. I don't know if I told you the story already. I might've told you already, no. but he was diabetic. And, uh, one day, so one day I'm, I'm at my, I'm hanging out with my cousin in Rockaberries, which is a restaurant around here, where they have like these amazing pies. And I was like, why isn't he calling me? I haven't heard from him for like three days. What's going on? I was, I, I remember venting to my cousin about it. Like, Oh, this guy, I'm going to break up with him. As soon as he gets back in touch with me, I'm going to break up with him right away. <laughs> and later that, right. As I was telling her that I get a phone call from his mother and she basically told me that unfortunately there was, he, he died in his sleep. Oh. Because he sake. didn't take his insulin that day. Wow. And that was a harsh awakening to me. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. imagine me at 17. Because you're first faced with mortality. My first boyfriend. And I'm faced with, you know, him passing away. Shit. And that made me grow up really quick. Yeah. And I think if I had to say that a defining moment, I guess that would be a defining moment. Because I think after that, I sort of realized life is precious. Mm. We're not, we're not, you know, and, um, nothing lasts forever. And that it, you need to take more risks in life. Yeah. So, so that I you was can gonna, really I was going to ask, life, did that you know? sort of galvanize you into, um, into, into making drastic changes in your life? Like, did you, I mean, of course you went through a period of mourning, right? But I guess yeah. you always come out stronger. Or, or changed at least as a person. Like I was what was different? Changed. What was different about you from the Medina? What that you was were different before? is, I I I think I uh, I learned to be. A, I I got stronger. I think I learned to be a stronger person. Mm. I learned to not take things for granted. Mm. I still do sometimes take things for granted, but yeah. I'm trying my best not to. But I definitely, you know, uh, learned to appreciate things more. Appreciate people more. Yeah, yeah. And when I was, when I reflect on it, I'm kind of like, 
I told myself, you know what? If I would have known that he was going to die, would I have not bothered to be with this person? Because I would have been mm. like, I don't want to lose. I don't want to feel that. You don't want to go through that. Yeah. But I realized actually, no, you know what? Even knowing that someone's not going to be there forever, it's still worth it to create that connection. Yeah. It's still worth it to create that connection because connections are beautiful. And that is what life is all about. Mm. So I think that you don't need to be so afraid that like, oh, this might not last forever. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, nothing, nothing lasts forever. And yeah. the sooner people realize that, the more free you are to take those risks and take those chances, chances and, and live your life more authentically. Yeah. So I guess that's part of what I learned through this whole experience. That's very good. I'm, you know, this is out of left field, I guess, but it reminds me of Blade Runner. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. I don't know if you've seen one of the long ago, 20, long ago. yeah, one of the 20 versions yeah. of this movie. There's one version. I think it's the right. version with the voiceovers, which is not very popular. It's like the worst version. Okay. But um, I mean, the whole movie is about that. There, there's humans that are there's humans and there's replicants, and replicants are sort of androids, um, but they become sentient and they start questioning right. their own existence, and then um, mm -hmm. you know you you don't really know if the main protagonist is also an android or not. That's sort of left up in the air and up to debate, mm. or, you know. And then in the end, he gets together with one with an android woman, and uh, he's like, and yeah, they have an expiration date built in, right? And she's already passed that wow. date, but she's still alive. And uh, in one of the versions, um, his, his voiceover says, uh, "Well, we don't know how much time we have together now." Um, but then again, who does? And that's the final. That's exactly. the end of the movie, you know. And I, I do like that quote, although I, I would agree that that version is probably not very good. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch it again watch the final cut that's a good that's a good version of that movie okay yeah <laughs> but that's anyway, it yeah um you know and i think um, that these lessons you know i i kind of i think i took it forward into all my future relationships after that like just kind of like okay well you know maybe this won't last forever but let you know it's going to enrich it your might life. be a connection worth having yeah exactly it's still an enriching exactly. connection it's an enriching experience and you don't have to, you know, uh, fashion your life only around the things that you think are going to last forever. Yeah. You can no, afford not. to you can't. take a detour, yeah, you know, absolutely. make a mistake if, it's, you know if I, it's a mistake. Nothing's really a mistake. It's an experience. It certainly isn't. Yeah. But what I found is what has been a constant for me and just the saving grace in many situations has mm -hmm. been music. Because something, you know, there's, there's things you can't make last forever. And, and I would argue most, right? But music stays Everything. with you, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. I've been a I've been a collector for thirty years now. I started collecting music. Well, I, I my my dad gave me my first CD in nineteen eighty nine ish. Uh, it was wow. either Paul Simon's Graceland album or uh, the Roxette Joyride album. It's right. got to be either one of these two that was my first CD ever. I don't know at this point. But you know, a few right. years later, and when I had fifty CDs or so, I realized, wait, I might be a collector. You know, so um, <laughs> but you know, so that was, that was, yeah, thirty years ago. And um, you know, even music dating back to, to all that time, like you, you go back to it, you listen to it now, and it's yeah. it's a recording. You know, you can go back to it and listen to that, and it's like these pers these people sing for you. You know, uh, although they don't they back. don't know me. You know, it takes like, you back. yeah, exactly. It takes me back, and it but it also grounds me. It reminds me of who I am. You know, not mm -hmm. not who I am today. Uh, also, who I was before and mm -hmm. um what that makes me today you know and right. then of course it's terribly sad to hear that um you know when, when joe cocker passed away that was the first time that mm -hmm. it really hurt me a lot because uh, that's something you know i grew up with his songs i grew up with his voice and now uh like he mm -hmm. died you know and uh same thing yeah. with marie frederickson um who's the female singer um, from roxette who died last year way mm. too young you know like uh, the cancer came back mm -hmm. and got her you know and uh oh, gosh yeah it's uh it's shitty, you know, and that that's sad to hear. But then again, their music is out there, you know. They they create and that'll that, live on. You know? And that'll, that'll live, live on. on. It's, it's, and it's it's your legacy, you know. It's if your you're legacy, an artist, in a way, as an artist, yeah. if you're an artist and you're putting out music or you know mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. albums, that is your legacy. Yeah, and absolutely. And it will live on in some way. Yep, true. And I think that's why, and I think that's why what makes artists artists. We want to have something 
that lives on after us, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's part of, whether you're conscious about it or not, it's part of what makes you want to do what you do. Mm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> on that note <laughs> yeah that's a that's a great note that's a, that's just an uplifting note to end the conversation um uh, let's do a quick rapid fire another few minutes and then sure, pick another sure. song and then we're good okay cool um so a question that i just don't want to miss out on is okay and it might take you a moment to think about it but um what what guiding purpose do you see for yourself in life or let me put it in another way, is there a core tenet that you live by um, that, that, that sort of is, is a guiding principle for you? If you had to sum that up. I mean, there's probably many of them, but pick one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, are you saying like a mission statement or like a um, It could be purpose? that. It could be that, it could be a purpose, it could be also just a way to live life. Like for me, uh, like I said, the golden rule, I think is very, very true, right? Um, also, uh, one thing that I always find myself living by is if you can't change a thing that bothers you, then change your attitude towards it. Try to see if you can yes. change it. If not, then change your attitude. Because what else well, are you going to do? Um, yeah, but, so, so is there something like that for you? I mean, I think, I think I kind of, I, I think there's two things. Uh, I think what I said in the pre a few minutes ago is, is, is still very relevant today. And I, and I kind of put everything through this, through this lens is that nothing lasts forever. Mm. So why not? And that's just the response I give to myself. Whenever I ask myself a question, like, should I really do this? Should I take this vacation? Should I travel to this place? Should I meet this person? Should I do this activity? Should I pick this up? Should I quit this job? Should I do this? Should I do that? Well, you know, nothing lasts forever. So why not give it a try? Yeah. That's the way I look at it, at things. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is if you're talking about sort of, I've actually recently decided what my mission statement is going to be. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I have a mission statement. Um, and that is that, and, and now I'm also sort of analyzing everything I, I do through this lens as well. At the end of the day, I really just want um, to bring joy to people through music. Mm. And I do this in multiple ways. By being an artist, I'm creating music that hopefully people enjoy um, or relate to. I like to do shows, and hopefully that creates joy during the moment that I'm doing the show and people enjoy the show. Um, and I make their day a little bit better. I also teach kids and adults how to play piano, and hopefully that brings joy to their own lives by learning by learning about music. And also these events that I sometimes organize around music and songwriting. For example, this competition that I'm organizing and, and promoting for teenagers that are songwriters. Um, I, I create this annual competition yeah. for teens to showcase their, their original material. Um, so I'm on the organizing committee of this project and I feel like that is allowing kids to, to explore themselves musically. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings joy to them as well. Yeah. So overall, I've decided that from now on, I'm going to live my life with that purpose in mind. Yeah. Anything, any new projects or activities that I take on, does it bring joy to people in some way related to music? Okay, cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. Good answer <laughs> to that question. I like it. Um, Thanks. And it, it, it is you. I can, you know, from the times I've known you, that, that is you. So I, I'm finally Thumbs living up. my life better, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, I was working in these companies, you know, a yeah, project yeah. manager in a software company. I was uh, working in advertising for a while. Um, and those were necessary for the time that I was there. But but they were not fulfilling you gotcha. know, at the end of the day. And I'm right now, today. I live my life a lot more. It all makes more sense now. Mm, <laughs> everything yeah. that I do. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. How would we, um, out of the conversation that we had now, um, what would be a good takeaway that we should end on? Like what would be like a core 
takeaway. I'm just thinking of a synonym, but there's <laughs> none. Uh, you know what? <laughs> what would we? What a would we leave <laughs> people with? Yeah. What would we leave people with? Well, um, out of the subjects that know. we touched on, like, how would we condense this? Take more chances in life. Take more chances in men, life. Men should take more chances in life with women. <laughs> yep. And the other For way example. around, please. <laughs> and the other way around, yeah. Uh, you know, be more open. Yeah. Uh, open yourself up to change and evolution, because that's usually a good thing. Yeah. That's a and, very good... Um, yeah. I like that. Make more connections in life. Because mm. at the end of the day, that's what, that's what our lives are about. Connections. Yeah. I like that. I'm taking some notes. <laughs> no, because you know what's going to happen. Uh, it, you thought, thought this probably with Ricky's podcast, which, by the way, is also the first episode of this podcast. Uh, Melina is here as my second guest. And the first person I interviewed was Ricky, which also I thought was a very intriguing and inspiring conversation. Um, so mm -hmm. what I did was I created a, a tagline um, that I put mm -hmm. on the thumbnail for the video. And I created a small, or one of the quotes, or one of the core things that I took away from the podcast, I put in as a, um, as a, as a title for the video. Right. And uh, I yeah. actually stole that uh, both of those. Uh, no, one of those ideas from Ricky, uh, who has his own podcast, Works. which is also very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Um, by the way, link to makes Ricky, me want to start a podcast now too. To <laughs> my own podcast. Yeah, please do. Oh gosh, I don't know if I have time for this, but maybe, maybe one about, day I will. Yeah, beautiful maybe. thing about podcasts is that they have these, you, you can have these long form conversations that, you know, are so much right. better, so much more deep than a Twitter tweet, a Twitter tweet. Mm, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's, let's bring out, let's bring joy to people through yes. music. Yes. Please. We have at last, oh, the last album. Not the last, the most recent album, yeah. The Velvet Lounge, which I designed. Yep. And the first song is called At Last, Edda James, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep. Fever, Georgia on My Mind, Besame yeah. Mucho, Moon Dance, good old Van Morrison, Cry Me a River, Le Feuille Mort, The Girl from Ipanema, Summertime, This Masquerade, The Look of Love, uh, not the ABC song. Save the Last Dance for Me and La Vie en Rose. Ah, yeah. Um, what, do I you like have a favorite you, of that one? I like that you picked a few songs that are not standards. Um, you have the ah. standards in here. Um, uh, like, you know, Crimea River, Fever, At Last. Th those are songs that are very well known. And it's very well treaded territory. Uh, but then you, we have... Um, Le Feuille Mort, that, that's not necessarily something I, kn no, I knew before. No, it is, it is, though. That's the French version of Autumn Leaves. That's a standard. That's a oh, standard. Shit. Okay, then I'm, then that's just me being <laughs> stupid. Uh, let's, let's say, uh, nonsense, nonsense. Well, clearly, clearly, Pesame Mucho, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that one uh, before. Um, it's a great track. And the it's girl a, it's from a Bossa Nova track. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Summertime is a very beautiful rendition, and it's not overdone. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, okay. This masquerade. I don't think I knew this masquerade before. Ah, that's a um, yeah. well. George Benson has the most uh, famous version of that. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it's a it's a great song. It's yeah. A great song. Um, out of these, I. It's hard for this one. It's hard to pick one. I have to admit, they're all good. You know. But there's not one, and that, that's not that's not saying mm. that's not saying something against this album. But there's not one that stands out. It's just all quality material, mm. you know. And <laughs> right. um, yeah, perhaps fever. Um, although I'm not too sure. Uh, oh, I, I'm yeah. not sure. I, I'm really not sure. Um, let's do. You want something up tempo or, or down tempo? I mean, they're all kind of down tempo. But <laughs> which one? Let's do something like, a little bit more uplifting. Like a ballad, or do you want like a like swing or, yeah. or bossa? Uh, swing a bossa nova. What would you okay. say? You you pick it. Come well, on. it's your it's your. If I if I were to pick a tune that I think probably exemplifies that album the best, mm -hmm. I would say either Girlfriend Panima. Okay. Or um, Moon Dance. Moon I would Dance. I would pick those two. Yeah. Moon Dance. That would be my. Let's do it. Yeah, Let's because I'm. I, I love Van Morrison. He's fantastic. 
Yeah, okay. this is Beautiful. a Van Morrison tune and uh, done by the Velvet Lounge Melina Suchan Quintet. Nice. Beautiful. <laughs> so let's listen to that. And uh, anything else um, you want to say? Parting words? Well, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. It's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks Somehow three hours went by without us noticing. I know, it just <laughs> flew by. I hope it flew by for our listeners, for the two listeners that are still around. Um, and uh, One of those will be my mom, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank thanks to everybody. Thanks to you guys for watching. Um, drop a like if you if you like this video. Um, let it be known. Drop a dislike if you don't like it. Um, I, I won't mind. You know that's that's also something we can learn from. Um, leave us comments. Like literally, if anything inspired you that we talked about. Um, if you have any any thoughts on anything we said. If you thought if you wished we had gotten deeper into a certain subject. Um, please let us know. And let us know what, what you think um, about some of the questions we, we mentioned here. And, um, and subscribe. So now I think that's the holy trinity of, of YouTube, right? Like, subscribe, and comment. That's the thing. Yeah, now I, yes. I've done it. I've done it. Okay. Thank you very much, Melina. <laughs> you enjoy your lunch. Um, I'm going to enjoy my dinner. Thank you. And we shall talk again soon. Now. All right. Here's, Thank uh, you so much. Here's Moon Dance. Thank you. Bye. It's a marvelous night for a moon dance With the stars up above in your eyes A fantabulous night to make romance Neat the cover of October skies And all the leaves on the trees that are falling To the sound of the breezes that blow And I'm trying to please to the calling Of your heartstrings that play soft and low And all the Seems to whisper and hush And all the soft moonlight Seems to shine in your blush Can I just have a moment dance with you, my love? Can I just make some moment dance with you, my love? Well, I just want to make love to you tonight I can't wait till the morning has come And I know now the time is just right And straight into my arms you will run And when you come my heart will be waiting To make sure that you're never alone there and then all my dreams will come true, dear There and then I will make you my own And every time I touch you You just tremble inside And I know how much you want me that You can't hide
Beneath the color of October skies And all the leaves on the trees are falling To the sound of the breezes that blow When I'm trying to please to the calling Of your heart strength soft and low And all the night's magic seems to Can I? 